they like donated a ton of their money to charity and all that kind of stuff yeah they did a lot of how, good stuff. how do you know th- why do you why do you know this um because i think it's going to lem deep dive i did go on a lem deep dive at one point why i don't know why oh my okay i don't know why right. i think i was just do curious you know, about do you, know, do, you, do, you what, do you want to talk about this <clears throat> i don't think we need to talk about the onion <laughs> <laughs> i think we can just let it be <laughs> Let the onion be. Just let it be, Drew. Let the onion be. It is what it is. Are we good? Are we good position here? Okay, I think we're good. Yeah, I think I feel good. Let's do it then. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 44 of the Goulet Pencast, where your fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this... Oh, what are we delivering? This casual and informal, I've only done this 44 times, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about pens for someone's 50th birthday. So what would live up to the hype? Uh, Pens that we've redeemed, that were once outcast in our own minds. Uh, Fixing tines that are too spread apart when pens should and shouldn't come with converters, and what's my problem with Yerushi, <laughs> we are going to spotlight the Diplomat Elox, and we have a pen converter cleaning tip, pen and converter cleaning tip, and you can use it uh, in other ways too. So Plumbing. Yeah, lots of fun stuff. Plumbing? I don't know. Just plumbing in general. Probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's start it off uh, with some feedback, Drew. Okay, let's kick things off. So we've got a YouTube comment from Steven. And Steven says, I've only been into fountain pens for about three years, but your Mm. company has been by far the most efficient and enjoyable to buy from. Thank you, Steven. Um, I can't imagine not having fountain pens in my life now. I find the entire experience to be relaxing, soothing, and therapeutic. Drew, I definitely agree with you on one specific thing. If I can't post a pen, it's not my life. Post or die. Wow. Yes. I mean, all pens? There's certain pens that like I prefer not to post. I mean, most pens I, I like them. To, I like the option to be there. I like the option. I like having the option. I'll say that. Yeah. Even if you post it and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. But at least I have the choice. Yeah. You know. I I, I do post more than not. More often than not. I, I'm I, I'm with you. I've I've evolved a little bit over time personally. I didn't I, used to. I didn't start posting. I was an avid poster from the very beginning. And you went the other way. And but I've I've broadened my horizons a little bit. I'm oh. not quite as picky about the posting or not. It's very selective. I'm not picky pen. about it, but I do prefer it and I do like it and I am like extra happy when it happens well. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm with you. Um and then our friend Graham, also on YouTube. Uh, said this that I thought was pretty profound and relevant to some previous topics we discussed. Um, He more or less starts talking about the effect that some inks, modern inks, can have in vintage sack fillers like we discussed on last episode. But he had uh, something to say about the fact that he's never had a single problem maintenance-wise with Iroshizuku in his vintage Parker. So here's someone that does use vintage okay. sack filler pens yeah. with Iroshizuku inks, which, okay. as we mentioned okay. last time, maybe have a reputation for not being great for those. Um, he suggests that we should be more concerned about the opposite, and that is using mm. older inks in modern fountain pens hmm. because older inks had some crazy stuff in them. Oh, they did. They had like carcinogens and stuff. They were, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. He, talked, he talks about phenol specifically. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that is not something that we often talk about. He's got a good point there. Mm-hmm. And to his point, I will agree, that is a much more dangerous combination than putting modern inks in vintage pens. I yeah, think I mean, especially because... Things the, are much more regulated now. Well, especially like the materials that pens are made of. I mean, they are going to... Much more resilient. Yeah, they're going to hold up longer than, I mean, ink is water and other stuff. So yeah. it's not necessarily made to last like a half a century. So yeah. if you're using older ink, you need to be much more skeptical than yeah. if you're using an older pen. Yeah, he, he, he went on to discuss, you know, his findings with Parker ink and different types of old Parker ink had some really funky stuff in them. Some inks were yeah. okay, but yeah. there's definitely more of a, more of the Wild West back then. Or maybe it wasn't funky, but it's gotten funky over right. time. Yeah, potentially. Uh, mm-hmm. But he mentions that if a modern, in his opinion, if a modern ink is going to be problematic, likely we will have already have heard about it by now. Hmm. He, he then references uh, the fear factor surrounding base a blue and how its troublesome properties are um, potentially exaggerated and we've covered no. that we've covered that as well yes we have no. covered that as well things yes. exaggerated on the internet I know come on I know we have a slice about it where our very own Brian K kind of uh, demystifies that a little bit 
And in that, in the comments of that video, there were actually quite a few people who had said that they've been using Base State Blue in the same pen for a number of years mm -hmm. with very little maintenance, and it's been doing just fine. So okay. it, your you know, performance will, may vary. But yeah. he finally mentions that if Iroshizuku were liquefied, were <laughs> sorry, I like the way he says this. <laughs> I think that if Iroshizuku were liquefied disaster juice, then we would have heard about it by now. <laughs> So thank you, love, Graham, for I both. That. Yeah, thank you, Graham, for both the insight and the uh, liquefied disaster juice terminology. I think that mm. you're right. I think that if it was liquefied disaster juice, everybody would know about it. As we mentioned last episode, it's a super popular ink, so clearly oh, yeah. there's nothing pervasive wrong with it. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it falls into what we summarized last week, which is like if you personally have any concerns with it, just don't use it. There's, there's plenty, plenty of, of other inks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. All right, we got some other feedback here. This one is from Steve, not Steven. Ah. Uh, uh, Drew had a Steven, I got a Steve. Uh, I have several traditional style fountain pens, but found the best style for me is shaped like a pencil. I've been looking at the CP1 ah. and recently purchased one in North Carolina, I'm assuming, and see, maybe that's New Canada. I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> New France, the Canada. That's what I was thinking of. New Canada is not a thing. I don't New think. France is old Canada. That is old Canada. That's <laughs> true. Uh, it's a wonderful Bauhaus design pen. I got it with an EF nib, talking about the CP1. It writes smoothly, a little on the wet side, but fantastic to hold and use, unposted. There you go, Drew. Recommended this, fount oh, recommend recommended this fountain pen for all levels of users. P.S. Enjoy your podcast. Keep them coming. Uh, so we had lots of other people reach out about the CP1. Definitely got some love, some fans out there. Yeah, and that, so, yeah. I, that's a really good bit of insight because one thing we didn't talk about when we mm. were discussing the pros and cons of the mm -hmm. CP1, we didn't discuss how it might be a perfect pen for somebody, a perfect fountain pen for someone who is used to the form factor of pencils. Yeah. I think that's really accurate. It's a good point. Well, it's because pencils are garbage and we shouldn't care about them. Whoa, hold on. I'm totally kidding. I'm sure there's a <laughs> pencil out there that's not garbage. Sure. One the retro fifty one oh. fire and dice pencil hey. yet to be released. Sign up for the um, notification list. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I, I'm a pencil fan. Like I loved mechanical pencils when I was in school, younger, especially ones you could up, take so. apart. Oh, that's why I had them. It yeah. was an acceptable fidget toy mm -hmm. back in the '90s when we were in school. That was basically the reason why I liked it. I had a Doctor Grip pencil. That was my favorite pilot, Doctor Grip. Anyway, and then we got King Zarathus. Thanks for showing the hardworking shipping staff. As a repeat Goulet Pens customer, I've always had phenomenal service on the shipping side. If things do go wrong, the customer care team has been great for fixing the issue. One time, I had an entire ink sample leak out, which can happen from time to time. Due to the quality packing job, my paper products in the same order were all untouched, and customer care immediately shipped me a replacement ink sample set. We got a lot of feedback like this. So yes, we are thoughtful about that, especially like, okay, we're selling, you know, pretty expensive pens, paper that if it gets wet or bent or anything will be ruined and ink that if it breaks or leaks can ruin everything else in the package. So we, it's like a little puzzle that we have to figure out every single order that we put together. <laughs> so uh, try to be mindful of that. But yeah, no one wins when we have to reship something. No, not really. The shippers, I guess, because they're getting paid more. To that's ship true. That's things. true. So I guess the, cur the win. courier wins. Yeah. But you know, they're fine. They're busy enough. <laughs> no need to artificially make that happen more. So yeah. there you go. That's what we got as feedback. And uh, we got a light new stuff segment, but enough to make it worthwhile, we hope. All right. So this isn't really necessarily new. And we did mention the Goulet Notebooks last week. We did. And we talked about it. And we were like, you know what? Maybe we should put some on sale. We got a little time right now, and I think we can handle that. So uh, we're going to do a week-long sale. We're looking at May 2nd through May 9th. So you have a little bit of a heads up here to do it. So don't rush right over to the website. Just be ready for that. But week-long, so it's a, like a Wednesday to Wednesday, I think, is when we're looking to do that. Um, you know, why not? So we'll have them on sale on all the details because we literally just decided it this morning as we're shooting this Bencast. But uh, that will be happening. So look and on the website during that time. Are Tomoe River notebooks OG. so OG. some of the best paper on the market right now mm -hmm. and if you want to show off your inks if you have inks with shading shimmer multi-tonal features mm, yes or just want to if showcase you your ink at its peak if of you, awesomeness if you love long dry time lots of smearing and smudging this is the paper for you you know what some <laughs> Beauty I'm comes really, at a cost, really Brian. Sell it. You, well, you're right. It's physics, right? You can't have it all. You can't have it all. That's true. But there it's a great paper, and it is a lot of fun for showing off your ink. 
Absolutely. It's well worth it. This is what I use in my like daily carry notebook. And I just carry a little piece of blotting paper or something in between. And it's really fine. I just write it, close it, go. No worries. And that's pretty much all I got. We have a lot of new products that are coming, but nothing that's coming soon enough to be worth talking about right now. Uh, let's move on now to an actual segment that we have called Q&A. All right, Drew, you picked some interesting questions this week. Yeah. Interesting ones. There yeah. were some interesting ones. I had, to, I, had to, I had to put some thought into some Ooh, of some these. brainers. Yeah. No deep dives. No deep dives. But brainers. All right. Fair enough. Well, the first question comes from our friend Emilio. And Emilio asks, well, states... I recently bought the Visconti Dark Ages and a Mont Blanc Meisterstuck 149. Mm -hmm. Both are great bends, but I want to buy something really special for my 50th birthday in two years. Mm -hmm. Are there any suggestions for custom-made pens? Custom-made pens? That's what Emilio is asking. Wow. So I'll be honest, this is not like our total area of expertise because we don't sell custom that hasn't made stopped pens. us before though it doesn't stop us from talking about things on the pen cast it may delegitimize the actual subject that we're talking about and maybe how much you should heed our words mm -hmm. um, but i mean we've been around pens for a while and we've been to pen shows and we know pen folk so for sure, we have some knowledge on the subject, especially if you don't know anything about it. Um, so again, we don't sell custom-made pens. Nope. Like one-of-a-kind kind of a thing, which that sounds like that's what Amelia is going for. So, some of our pens are one-of-a-kind, but they, they're they not manufactured yeah. specifically for one person. Yeah, yeah. Well, one-of-a-kind as in like we designed it and have an exclusive on it, but there's more than one pen being made. Well, there's some pens that have an amount of hand work on them that makes sure, them unique or sure but i'm i'm thinking like not like a one-to-one -one duplicate you know okay fair enough that's true that's true like the design on this will vary from yeah. pen to pen the material mm -hmm. okay sure and or you know maquillage artwork things like that see when i think custom made yeah. i think made to order i like think that's you probably are, what okay. he was talking about so for that you're not going to pick that up usually from a retailer like us you're going to get that from an independent pen maker, usually having to buy direct through the manufacturer. So we do sell some brands that do that, like Edison. They have their signature line, which are pen models that are only available to them. Or you can get, you know, even models that we carry, you can still custom order them directly from Edison if you wanted to get some specific, you know, color material or, you know, slightly change up the size or get a custom nib or whatever. Um, you can do that through a company like Edison. I'm thinking Franklin Kristoff, Carolina Pens. There's a lot of independent scriptorium. There's like a lot of independent pen makers that do that type of thing. That's like their main, I guess, business model. Is there, You know what they're doing? Do. They're doing pen shows. They're doing that kind of a thing a lot. Franklin Kristoff does this thing where if you buy 50 pens, mm -hmm. the, the, the 50th one, they'll give you like a 50th one for free. That'll have your name in it. Oh, well, so for your 50th birthday. So all Emilio needs to do. Clearly should buy 49 well, no, pens. No, before the 50th <laughs> birthday. Before the 50th birthday, he just needs to buy 49, 49 pens Franklin from Christophs. Franklin Christoph. He's okay. got two years. Okay. Um, And then. No no affiliation with them on the pen side and, here. We, ben we would benefit nothing if no, we would went this is, and did no, this. We don't, we don't sell them normally. We carry one Franklin Christoph pen a year. Yeah. And we and, carry their, then, their pen then cases. Your 50th. On your 50th would be free. Hey, that sounds like a totally deal. Totally free. No strings I mean, attached other than if you 49. Wanna, if you want to buy 49 of something else from us, I'll give you the 50th for free. I mean, that's, <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Like, I'll do that. Well, let's work something out. Yeah, buy, um, buy 50 pens from Goulet <laughs> Bryant. I'll give you, just give you that's one for free. Pens. That's Boom. a lot of pens. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, going with an independent pen maker, you know, that for sure is a good route. Uh, there are also people who will do custom like finishes or they'll adapt. I mean, ad I don't know what you, what you call it. I, I, Yurushi lacquer is what I think of as the most mm -hmm. common. Um, I don't know. Is it an upgrade? It's You're, just a customization. A customization. Yeah. yeah. So these are, um, there's a couple of them out there. I'm failing to recall their names specifically, but there's not many of them. No, there's not. And honestly, uh, uh, we probably shouldn't mention them because they're all insanely busy. They're all insanely, yeah. Like the, the wait list I know is at least a year for yeah. most of these. I, I'm getting folks. one done right now and it's been over a year. Yeah. So you, well, if you got two years, you may want to do it now Leo, <laughs> and you might get it by your 50th. Um, but there are people that will, they don't sell the pens necessarily, but they do, they basically do Yurushi work and they'll do yeah. it on whatever pen you send them. So you could get whatever pen, you could even take one of the ones you have now, 
because you have some pretty nice pens already, Emilio, and you could send it to one of these Urushi artists and wait probably the full two years and then get your pen back and it would be special and unique to you. Um, so those are the two options that I kind of really think they are both going to take a lot. They're both going to take a lot of time. It's less so on the custom made pen route, but there's usually still a pretty decent wait list, probably several months for most of the pen makers out there. So take that into account, uh, but you have time. And then um, I would say maybe consider if neither of these options sound appealing to you, consider maybe getting like a limited edition pen, maybe something from a production oriented pen maker, you know, like you mentioned Visconti and Montblanc and all that kind of stuff. So I think if you went with one of those brands that have a limited edition that is appealing to you, that has some kind of theme to it that comes out near or around your birthday, and it could be a special pen, it's still something that is only made around the time frame of your birthday, that is still pretty memorable. Yeah, so it's like represents that time kind of. Yeah, thing. or if you can, another route I was thinking is like, you know, is there a, you know, sometimes pens will do anniversary pens for their own, you know, birthday anniversary things. Is there like a 50th a, you know, anniversary edition of some kind of pen. Yeah, I mean, you could I, get, even if it's point, vintage, like that's kind of cool to get a 50th pen from somebody for your 50th birthday. But like, I don't know, a lot of the established pen companies have been around for like 100 years. Yeah, I mean, so they had a 50th back. anniversary at some point, but yeah, that's but, a vintage pen. But did they do something, like did Pilot do anything for their 50th? That would be 50 years ago. That would be like a while ago, yeah. yeah. Both, like, both Pilot and Sailor would be about Sailor, 50. Like, and then uh, Platinum too. Platinum is is over 100 years ago. They're, they're all, they all. Lamy, Lamy is possible. I don't know if they did anything specifically for their 50th. And then you have to consider like, you know, which pen model or are you talking about the whole company because they kind of yeah. do things different i don't know a lot of the pen companies are super old or not at 50 years yet yeah. I, I can't really think of a lot that are around that 50 year mark so i don't know if that would really do it but those are kind of the things that ran through my head at least as ideas what um the thing that popped into my head obviously you know i went with you it's like we don't really sell custom pens and i i couldn't even point you in a direction right now that i think would be <coughs> your best route to get something you know prior to two years that's right for you However, if I were you, I would say, why don't you get something that is completely unique to you? Something that is a numbered, you know, maquille of some kind, something that mm. someone's hands had a lot to do with. If you, the more hand work that goes into a pen, the more unique it's going to be just mm -hmm. due to the fact that a human being produced it. Yeah. Uh, anything that has a heavy degree of maquille in it is going to also have Ooh. a heavy degree of variation and i don't want to say imperfection because it's they are perfect but yeah, uniqueness to it yeah and yeah, that handmade you've got uh, pilot that does that or namiki mm -hmm. properly yeah you've got sailor you've got platinum and sometimes pelican as well mm -hmm. tachi now tachi oh tachi that. would be yeah. a great example absolutely if you, especially if you have a brand that is doing a decent quantity of it i'm thinking like namiki they often do you know upwards of maybe a hundred of some of their you know numbered limited editions trying to get one that is like number 50 out of whatever, or something that is the like your birth year or something like that, that could be a cool little nod. You know, it's not, the pen itself is not customized, but it is still a unique numbered pen. Right. Maybe that's an interesting way to go with and it. And it's not like, you know, the numbers and the uh, and everything are like engraved on these pens. They're painted on. With, on the Machia ones, true. Yeah, with the Machia ones is what I'm thinking of, the, mm -hmm. the Namikis. Numbered by hand and the signature of the artist is right there on the pen as well. That with the cool. higher end one, it's one person with some of, not the lower end one, you can't really say lower end, Namiki Makie. More attainable. Yeah, more probably. attainable ones. It's usually a, a team of Arushi artists. Yeah. Uh, so you'll have the team signature on yeah, there. Yeah. Either way though, you're getting something that is 100% yours. There is no exact replica of it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you, I, I can't, I would not be able to spend this, but if you did want to get their annual edition, they're in that like $10,000 range. That's a lot of money. Mm. But if that was within your budget, we've sold them before. So we we do have them out there. Uh, the one that comes out on the year of your 50th would be significant as well. Yeah. I don't even know if I could save up that much in two years. Yeah, maybe <laughs> if I start now, a for a pen if budget, I start yeah. now, I might be able to get one by the time I'm 50. Yeah. I mean, hey, to each their own, right? Oh, wait, no. No, I wouldn't. That's like just a little over 10 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're not, uh, not getting uh, any younger here, Drew. Oh, God. I'll be joining you here soon. My birthday is uh, 
Well, as of when this publishes, my birthday is tomorrow. So I'll be 30, I'll be in the 38 club. Well, how about that? How about it? Is that almost 40? Can you say almost 40 when you're Welcome. 38? We have onions. Oh, we do have onions. Look at that. <laughs> Drew's like fixated <laughs> on these onions. I just came in. <laughs> <laughs> so I had extra onions at home because if we get like, sometimes we order meal kits and stuff and my kids don't want the onions. So we'd leave them out of our little meal kit. And we had like three onions just chilling there. Yeah, like, why like, are there onions on the table? So I, just, I brought them in. I was going to put them in the kitchen for other team members to enjoy. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have time to run over here. to the kitchen first. So I just put them on the table and Drew walks in. And he's like, why are there onions on the table? And I was he's like, like, well, I had them in a bag, but I had to give the bag to somebody I else. I gave the, ba- the bag to somebody else. So, so I then, have onions but in I no bag. haven't had time to walk them all the way over there. So, you know, there's onions know. on the table. It's just so random. I like it. It is very random. It makes me happy. I'll agree. All right. You ready for the next question, Drew? Sure. Are you over your onion? No, I'm not. Here? I'm not, but go on. All right. I got a question from Jess. Jess asks, have you ever written off a pen as a bad performer only to realize later that it was actually a paper or ink issue? Mm. Hmm. Mm, Yes and no. I have had pens that did not write the way I wanted them to. I thought they were defective, Mm. so I put them away. Mm-hmm. Sad because I liked like the physical pen, but I didn't like the way it wrote. Oh, so I didn't yeah. want to like sell it okay. or get rid of it. Okay. Because I, I like it and I wanted to love it, but you know, yeah. I just put it away being mm-hmm. sad. Mm-hmm. And then later I found a ink paper combination that did work better for it. Okay. And I could write with it again. Okay. However, it wasn't it was still jankety. Like it was still Oh really? There, it still had I mean it still had problems. I mean a, a good pen with no problems should write on a variety of paper with a variety of ink. So I mean yeah. it still had yeah. issues clearly. So okay. it was probably a time thing. The feed might have been just kind of Was it do you think it was like an actual issue with your pen or was it just like not to your preference? No, something? it was it was an issue. It was a oh. QC Q, some QC issues. Okay. And it's fine. Like I still I have a couple of them like that. Like I, I mm. wish the QC was a little bit better. There were some probably imperfections, but if like let's say it's an overpolished nib, I've had those before. You probably have too. Yeah, I know it's you not have. A, not an uncommon thing. No, yeah, it, it's it's a thing. I find that unpolished. I mean, sorry, overpolished nibs tend to do worse on really slick paper. Yeah. Definitely. If you get that thing on some Triumph or mm-hmm. some ninety gram Clairefontaine, yeah. it's not it's not fun. It it just doesn't have enough to kind of like catch. You know. Yeah, you end up with a lot of like hard starting and it's like skipping it's like it's like a, it's like, like a really you know greased up bowling ball on a bowling alley. You know when you roll the ball, but sometimes it doesn't even roll. It just kind of like slides. You don't see it spinning. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I don't because I when I bowl, I throw my ball as hard oh as God. I possibly can. But that's what reminds me of. It's like it's just <laughs> kind of moving and not catching enough friction to actually make mm. it work okay so okay. you need those paper fibers to grip that ink and pull it down onto the paper so mm-hmm. i find that if i switch to some paper that's a little not grainy but something like a Lloydsturm or an apica something with yeah. a little bit more less, gri- less of a coating on yeah, it. yeah a little more grippy uh, yeah. i feel like that more works better for something that's in that over polished realm that definitely helps yeah to deal with that because basically when you're dealing with something that's over polished like that you don't have as much. It, it's it's hindering some of the capillary action. Yeah, because this this is what's the term baby's it, bottom. If yeah, you've it's ever heard creating of it. like a gap where yeah. the ink isn't touching the paper. Yeah, and, and if so you have a more fibrous paper, it kind of reaches up into that gap like a brush, getting to those hard to reach mm-hmm. spots in your teeth. You know, if you had your teeth are bumpy, if you had a toothbrush that was just flat, then you're not going to get into the mm-hmm. crevices of your molars. You know, you've got yeah. those peaks and valleys. So can we just stop for a second? What is up with toothbrushes these days? Some of these designs they have on toothbrushes, I'm like, what is happening? With the rubber with bits and everything like that? Okay, I I get the like textured- What is the deal with rubber toothbrushes? Ba- no, I gotta stop for a second because this is like, I experience pain in my life with this. Oh my. So toothbrushes that have the like- textured kind of rubber back or whatever, which I get, it's meant to be like a tongue scraper, yeah, yeah. which first off, why? Because you can just use the bristles of the toothbrush. You're not gaining anything by having this rubber thing. But then when I'm brushing my teeth, that rubber thing is like scraping the insides of my cheeks. Wait, what And I it? don't like that. And it, sometimes my cheeks are sensitive and it's painful. Like, not like that painful, but it's I've just- I've never experienced this. Yeah, or if you have like a canker sore or something, you're trying to brush oh, your teeth yeah. and you got like that textured crap on the back. Yeah. I'm like, what? What is this all about? Get, your, get yourself smooth back. To get my yourself a, a Sonic Care or something like that with a nice smooth back. So I have a, I have a, I have an elect- electronic toothbrush, but it's got that stupid texture jacket really? on the back. Yeah, like and with a, with a like, plastic re- removable yeah, head. Yeah, oh. I have one of those, but that's weird. It's a, it's not a very expensive one. It's, mm. it's on the cheaper side. But I'm yeah. just like, why? 
Who, who's asking for this? Who's asking for textured backs on your toothbrush? Even if you are asking for it, don't tell him because clearly, clearly he has a. He has Am a, I missing something here? He has a bone know. to pick. This really isn't very important, but you know, speaking of toothbrushes, someone sent me yet another artistic rendering. <laughs> Of a Droulet, oh, a Droulet toothbrush. Brush. I got a second one. Tell you one thing. If we did a Droulet toothbrush, it would not have any tongue scraping no, nonsense on it. No. That serves no purpose no. at all, especially for pen cleaning. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Just What tongues. were we talking about? What was the, what was the pen question that started um, all I'm this? talking about over-polished stuff. So I, I said that okay. with smooth That's paper, right. um, it's kind of a no-fly zone for over-polished nibs. And likewise, mm -hmm. if you have a pen that might have... This is the other one that I had. I've had over-polished ones, and I've also had ones where the tines were just either not right or the feed was not right. Either way, my flow was not great. Mm -hmm. So I switched to a really, really wet ink that yeah. normally in other pens was like too sloppy and just feathered like crazy. The output was too much that I could, couldn't handle. And then mm -hmm. I put it in this, you know, jankety pen with bad flow. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this is nice now. So, yeah. so no, I, I didn't mistakenly write it off. I wrote it off because it was a messed up pen, <laughs> but I was able to, you know, Find a way to love it, I guess. Yeah, you limit your options because it's not like you can just not have to think about which pen or ink yeah. or paper or ink combo you use, but you found a way to make it work, right? Yeah. And that's when you relegate it and you're like, okay, this is going to be the pen that uses this ink in this notebook. And, and I wouldn't maybe do it'll that. Maybe a desk pen and I'll just keep it with that notebook and it'll just live there. Exactly. I wouldn't yeah. do that for every pen because sometimes it's just not worth it. But sometimes yeah, I, I mean, really, really love the design or the body and I okay. just, I want to love it so bad I will put up with that stuff. But a lot of times I'm like, no, this can go to someone else. This can go to a new a new home or you can get it tuned or professionally yeah. repaired. I mean, okay, so like we're a retailer, right? So if you're buying from us and the pen is, is that jankety and it's like actually not writing as it should, you should really tell us about it and we will like yeah. look into it, help you troubleshoot it, fix it, whatever. Yeah. I, I'm different because I... I you know, have to deal with this stuff all the time. So I'm like really lazy about, you know, complaining about stuff. I'm just like, you know, I'll figure it out. Well, you probably have access to more pens. Than I'll deal your with average it. Person, I have lots of parts so, too. Yeah, that's true. I have yeah. lots of parts. Drew, Drew does Franken pen his pens sometimes. I mean, I have a selection of yeah. appropriate, of yeah. appropriate replacements. I don't, I don't blame you. So, yeah. I've been hoarding for 10 years. There you go. Yeah, me personally, it's my compensation has been a little bit less of the like, oh, this pen's not working as it should. Because I, you know, especially with shooting videos and stuff, like I want a pen to be accurately performing as one would expect. Yeah. Right? So like I'm a little pickier about that. But I certainly have preferences. And there can be differences in terms of how a nib feels on the page, in terms of its drag and, you know, wetness and stuff like that. Also, it could just be nib size. Um, so with me personally, when I'm thinking about a question like this, like kind of writing off a pen. I did that more in the early days before I truly kind of understood the pen ink paper trifecta. And before I understood that you could you could kind of work around some of that just with trying some of these different combos. And before I really had a good selection of things at my disposal to where I really could just be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'll try this different ink because I know it's wet, you know, wetter or drier or whatever. Right. If you're new and starting out and don't have a lot of these supplies, that can be kind of daunting. So I do get that. That was where most of my experiences like this came from. Uh, but I also am a little bit of a hoarder, and so I've never really gotten rid of any of my pens. So I hang on to all of them forever, which is why I have so many. But I think that most of the time when it was something that wasn't really performing like I wanted it to, it's because I was still learning what it was that I actually liked. So for me, mostly, it wasn't necessarily that the pen wasn't performing like it should. It was more that I didn't really understand how dark or saturated or how much shading or whatever a particular ink would normally have. And I was wanting the pen to be doing something to make that ink be different than it was appearing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like maybe what I needed actually was a more saturated ink or maybe what I needed was a broader nib, a wetter nib or something with that same ink. So it was more of a process of like, okay, I'm still learning, but just like I wanted a really deep saturated blue ink when I first started using pens. Not a shocker, I love blue. So that was my issue is that I was trying to use like a fine nib or a medium nib or whatever. And I was trying to use more of like a periwinkle blue instead of a deeper, like a cobalt. And it was just like, okay, I really want this thing to be doing something different than what either the pen or the ink was designed to do. And then over time, I then learned to appreciate what the pen was actually designed to do. And I was like, oh, if I'm using a pen on, you know, more absorbent paper, I actually like a finer nib or a medium nib. Or if the line ruling is smaller, 
I actually want to be able to write in a smaller script. And so I actually kind of like having some of these other properties and maybe an ink that dries faster so I don't have to worry about it smearing and stuff like that. Just over time as I used it and just gained experience, I actually learned to appreciate and, and just get the nuances of kind of what each of these things, pen, ink, and paper, all of them combined did. So I think if you're new to fountain pens, it's totally normal to have some of these experiences. And I would say, if you're, especially if you're buying a lot of different types of pens, you're probably going to have a pretty high ratio of pens that you don't quite understand or appreciate yet. But over time, as you get experience, you will learn to appreciate them more. And so I would encourage you to circle back to the pens that you have previously kind of like written off as ones that you didn't like, because even after six months or a year or two years, you're probably going to have a whole different perspective on that pen as you've gained experience. So that's what I encourage because I definitely have come full circle on a great number of pens. And uh, I have very few pens that I absolutely hate. I know. That makes it, which that makes, makes yeah. buzzworthy hypotheticals really painful for me. When I'm trying to do countdown lists because you're like favorite know, pens or cool. least favorite pens, I'm like, I just I uh, really like them all for different reasons. So the, anyway. The that's, burden of experience. That's been my experience. I know, right? It's a tough life. All right, Drew. Next one. Okay. This next one comes to us from Cynthia. Mm -hmm. And Cynthia asks, well, she says, really enjoy these videos. Yay. Mm. Uh, question though, on nibs, Ooh. if the times are spread too far apart, is there any way to fix them? Yeah. Fix them. Yeah. And is there a list of which brand slash model of mm. pens take your nibs, the Goulet okay. Yovo nibs. So Cynthia's kind of getting a two for one here. And she also says, appreciate your help. So you oh, this, have to be a, you that's actually. assumptive. Well, yeah, well, hey. <laughs> you're, uh, Cynthia, you're assuming I'm going to be helpful by answering go. your question. There you go. So you so, kind of have to be. All right, I got to rise to the occasion mm. here. Um, okay, so two pen questions related to nibs, but not related to each other necessarily. Yeah, like the, 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 the last one is easy to answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the ones about the times that are spread too far apart. So. Um, actually kind of riding off of what I just said about when I first got into pens, uh, I found that when I was using either nib sizes that were not broad enough for what I was actually wanting as a result in the, my line width, or the ink was not saturated dark enough for what I was desiring, I found that I was subconsciously compensating for that by writing with more pressure to get mm. more ink on the page. And so I did have a couple of pens, nothing terrible. I didn't like spring the tines necessarily to the point where they were unwritable. Right. But I definitely over time was like, oh, this, this pen with a medium nib writes a little bit broader than one that's fresh out of the there box. There was some movement that had occurred. Yeah. So over the, over the years, as I did that, even in my own personal collection, I had to then be cognizant of that. And, and it got better. It's not like I ruined a ton of pens or anything like that. But there were certain ones that I had to sort of fine tune after a little bit of time to make them maybe not quite as broad because I had unintentionally made them broader. Um, and we've done that. We did the tip. I do not remember which episode it was, but where you can basically kind of press down and do mm -hmm. several like hard strokes to actually intentionally widen your tines just a little bit. Super easy to do, super easy to ruin. So you gotta be careful doing that. But if you're trying to go the other way, it is far more difficult. If you're trying to take something that's a little too, the tines are too spread apart and you're trying to bring them back closer together, it's not so easy. You can't just like flip the pen over and then push the nib down and they'll come back together perfectly. Uh, doesn't really work like that. So I have a little bit I can explain here. I will say that it takes some practice. And if you don't know what you're getting into, you can ruin some nibs or maybe not ruin permanently, but ruin them beyond what you're able to fix yourself. So just understand you might take a pen that you kind of like, but wish it were a little bit better and you can make it into something that you now can't even really use and need to get fixed. Or you could make it to the, this route. or you could make it so that you can no longer return that pen to the retailer. Which yeah, you if bought you, it. yeah. If you're getting into like trying to narrow your nib, unless you have nib, tuning experience i would say don't if you're if you're thinking Talk to that, the retailer yeah, first if you've, if you've got a pen that isn't writing well and you think it might be a tine alignment or your spacing issue yeah. be it too close or too far apart don't do anything if you can still yeah. return it yeah. because you can if you do this and then say oh no that didn't work let me return it now yeah you're probably not going to be able to return it i mean at least at least if it's us goulet pens right reach out to us first let us know we have advised people in the past when it's tines that are too tight 
and do the thing that Drew recommended, like the the pressing down and spreading it Very, apart on certain pens yeah. where we have replaceable nibs available. Yeah. If we are advising that and it goes sideways, we can then make it right and help with the replacement. Right. But if you have some vintage pen that is irreplaceable and all that, we wouldn't advise you to do that because the risk is too high. So this is a very long disclaimer to say that if you're getting into most types of flow adjustment, it's more complicated maybe than you think, especially when you're going the direction that you're talking about here, which is trying to make it less wet. Um, but I'll at least explain the basics of kind of how it works. So, you know, I don't want to go too, too basic here. And I was like, okay, I'm going to stretch out my arms and do the, the hand the hand gestures here. Get ready. So when you have uh, nib tines, I don't know the best way to do I've never really talked about flow with my hands before. It's usually nib alignment, and I do the little hand thing, but that flow. doesn't quite so work. Yeah, Oosh. flow. I feel like we have an interpretive dance yeah. here. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so what happens when you have your, your tines are too far apart, right? Your, your pen is either going to write really wet, or it might actually not flow very well because your the capillary action is starting to break. The surface tension is not really keeping because your tines are too far apart, um, which, you know, the, you're working in three dimensions here, so it gets a little complicated. Sometimes the tines can be fine in terms of how close they are to each other, but they can be too far apart from the feed because they've been pressed up too much. Other times they can be fine there, or they can just be too far apart from each other, or they could be both and be all kinds of different directions. So it's hard to have a general statement because so much of it is you have to kind of look at the pen and see what's going on. Uh, but more or less, it's metal, so you can bend it. So it is possible to fix this in terms of whether the average pen user is capable of doing so in an efficient and you know, positive resulting way is kind of what's up for debate. Um, but basically you need to bend the tines back together, back towards each other, which is a little more complicated because it's kind of the opposite direction of where they want to go. So uh, not only that, but when you're bending metal and you're trying to get it to get in its final resting place, you have to basically overbend it and then it springs back into its final place. So when you're, when you're trying to widen your tines, you can do that because there's nothing on top of the nib, you can bend it and it'll do that. But when you're trying to go the other direction, the feed is in the way. You can't overbend it because it needs to be basically right up against the feed. So ideally, and this is in concept here, ideally you'd want to be able to take the nib off the pen or off, off, off the feed so that you can work with it without having the feed impeding it at all. That gives you the most amount of flexibility to work with it. Uh, and then you don't have to risk anything of the feed getting in the way or bending and breaking it, that kind of thing. Um, Cause I've definitely done that. I've actually snapped the tip off of tines and stuff, trying to do this very adjustment. So there's a couple different ways you can, in theory, do it. Again, all disclaimers involved. Um, you can remove the nib, and then you can just physically try to bend them back together. You know, if you kind of bend them down a little are you, bit. Are you talking about so solving the issue of the nib being too far away from the feed or the tines being too far away from each other? I mean, both, really. You could solve both by removing the nib. And then, you know, if it's if it's the tines are too far apart from the feed, you would basically just bend both tines kind of down. And as long as they're good in relation to each other, you can bend them down, and then that should get it closer to the feed. You put it back on, you make sure that it looks good. But do they get closer to each other doing that same motion? Um, usually they will. Okay, because that's not usually what I, I've never really tried that. Have I, you never really done that? I'll do that if it's too far away from the feed, yeah, but but being too far apart, I just, I, I, do, I, mean, the, I do the crisscross. So yeah, there's so there's two ways to do it, right? So this is really hard to show uh, here. And I thought about like, should we get like, the close-up camera and do this. But I keep saying I'm like, going to make a giant foam nib, and I and I haven't, haven't done, done it. Yet. I know, I know. I need so to for make me, the giant nib. For me, there's two there's two ways to do it. You can either take your thumbs, put them under the wings of the nib, and then take your index finger and kind of push down on the tip of the nib. So you're kind of holding it, pointing it towards you, and you kind of bend it down that way. So you're kind of flexing out the wings. You're pushing down the tip, and that will sort of bend the tines like whoop, like back towards each other like that. That sounds That's complicated. It. It's all complicated. There's no simple way to do any of this. Yeah. But that that's that's one way to do it. And then with the method that Drew's talking about, if you take the two tines and you basically, if you're looking straight at the tines and you crisscross one over top of the other back and forth like that, it'll kind of gradually work its way 
back closer together. That one is a little easier to do if the pen is still, if the nib is still on the pen. So if you aren't removing it and all that, to do the method that I talked about, it's really difficult to do with the feed in the oh, way. Oh yeah. So I've only so, ever done the overlap method. That that's what that's what we learned yeah. in Bender's class. So that's just what I've been sticking with. I've, I've done it both ways, and you can get good results both ways. That's the thing with most nib tuning is there's a couple different ways to get two things. A lot of it depends on the design of the nib. You know, like the crisscross thing, like I would do that for a Lamy nib because they're, the wings on there are not really... Exist? They're, they're not there. They're really not something that easy to grab onto. A traditional like Yovo or Bach like number six nib, you can do the wing like bending thing that I'm talking about or the crisscross either way. So I'd say if you're going to do one method, like the crisscross thing is... is one A little more universal there. probably. Yeah, perhaps. But, you know, the thing with any of this, with either of these, once you're bending them, it's, it's going to be very rare that you do that and then the nib is still aligned. Right. That's kind of so the weird thing about like, this maintenance is that, yeah. you know, the first thing and most easy thing to do is to align. Just bring them up or down depending on that. Mm -hmm. And then if you do the nib spacement, you also have to do an alignment. And then if you do like a third thing down the list, you have to do the spacing and an alignment. It's almost like you have to kind of gradu gradually do all of the things the more well, maintenance that's, you do. That's why it's so difficult to explain it I mean, we're not even showing you visuals here, so that's part of why it's so difficult. But uh, that's why it's so difficult to explain it in like a quick tip style video is because honestly, there are a lot of variables and it does depend on which nib you're using. And quite frankly, it just takes some experience to be able to do this reliably. So even if we put some videos out, and there are some other people that have done videos online and stuff like that uh, successfully, um, but not everything is universal and works for every pen. Uh, so hopefully I'm at least conveying enough to let you know that it's complicated and that maybe not everybody should try it because <laughs> it can be difficult and you can quickly like try to do some of this stuff and then you realize that you're out of your depth and then, and now you're worse off than you were before. So, um, I don't know if that's actually helpful or not. Um, but, and the other thing that, <laughs> that kind of drives me crazy too, is that, um, Oh no, wait, sorry. I was, I was moving on to my next point. Yeah. So that, yeah, that is the difficult thing. It's hard for us to give advice. We have to know specifically what pen you're talking about and what the actual issue is. Maybe one day we can have a guest on here that knows a little bit more about that than we do. <sighs> I mean, it would be good. Like we've gotten together with Mark Bacchus before and we like shot some video footage of what he was doing, but honestly it ended up being like hours long and it was You had that camera on your yeah. person for like six hours straight. I did and I've never done anything with that footage either publicly, but you know, you were, you were all about capturing the footage, though. Like, yeah, because I just like you have always yeah, taken note. Let, let me just let's just get it. I'm all for like if you can sit down with a nibmeister at pen show or anything. Like get that get that seat in that that. What am I trying to say? Get that time in the seat. Get that that time next to them. Soak up whatever you can. But that that's another thing, though. If you do have an issue, you can always go to a pen show and get a nibmeister to help you out. Mm -hmm. Their rates are still really good yeah. and. Honestly, there's and they take pens there's online there's too. more now than ever at these pen shows. Like That's you'll true. go to a, one true. of the larger pen shows, like say like let's say the ten most popular shows in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Generally, there'll be probably four or four more or five, yeah. um, people doing nib repair mm -hmm. or nib customization for you. So that's for stuff like not. we're talking about here, this is pretty basic stuff for a oh, yeah. Meister. So this would not be anything, even if you screw no. up. You know, say Easy you have a stuff. say you have a pen that's like a modern manufactured pen. It's a steel nib, whatever. Like, you don't have to be that afraid about doing this kind of stuff. Grinding and reshaping nibs, that, you can't really put that back. But just bending tines, I mean, yeah, okay, you could screw it up. Worst case, you screw it up and you're like, oh, well, now I got to send it to somebody. Okay, whatever, 30 bucks, 40 bucks, something like that. Worst case, they're all pretty reasonable with their rates. And then you can get that thing taken care of. So I wouldn't be like super scared of it, but just it's just know that it's not it's not like the simplest thing in the world to do. I now, think at the very least we've conveyed that. I think so. I think we can move on to the next question here, which is, um, is there a list of which brand and model of pens take your nibs? So we sell Yovo made number six and number five nibs. Um, so yes, there are pens that will take these nibs. However, we don't have a standardized list for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason, and probably the honestly most important one is that off, as an authorized retailer, it gets into a little sticky spot for us if we openly like promote replacement parts for a pen that's not made by that manufacturer. Um, cause then we're basically 
openly encouraging you to violate your warranties. So there actually has to be a little bit of a barrier there just logistically for us so that we're not making it so simple to replace the parts on their pen because then if they have any issues with it, that complicates things for the manufacturer, which complicates things for us as an authorized retailer. So we need a little bit of that in there. Um, but honestly, probably just as equally is that it's not that simple. There are things are, the parts are not so standardized that any number six nib will fit in any pen that says it takes a number six nib. Yeah. You have different manufacturers. There are different. And something's used to take number six nibs that no longer take it because something changed that we didn't know about. And then the customer says, Hey, these don't actually fit like they say they do. And they're like, well, sure they do. And we go check. Oh my God, they don't anymore. Let's change the website. Right. And there's different housings and feeds. So even if it's a number six nib, maybe it's not the same feed and housing. And maybe the pen itself actually changes over time because we've had that where the literally the same models will take a nib and then not take a nib. And we don't know. We're not testing every pen every month. So you're into you're just into trial and error territory here. You know, so it is frustrating understandably for you all to be trying to shop for a replacement nib and you're like, I think this one will fit, but I'm not 100% sure. It'd be so nice if I could just like filter it on the website and have some surety or if it was on the product page to say, this will take a Goulet number six nib, whatever. But unfortunately, it's just not so simple because it is in its essence a hack. You are hacking that pen. Um, So the best thing I would say is try to read up about what other people are doing. You're you're getting this idea from somewhere. So probably on whatever platform you see it, be it Instagram, YouTube, whatever, you can ask in a comment and the pen community is very generous or if we happen to see it, we can answer it for you. Um, Or honestly, just reach out to our customer care team and just say, hey, I have a whatever, Diplomat Arrow or whatever and I wanna replace it with one of your nibs. Will that fit? We can tell you yes or no or maybe so. If it's something we sell. True. If it's not something we sell, then we can't. I mean, obviously, we couldn't really tell you unless we just happen to know for sure. And even if we are pretty sure, it's just not something we like to do because. Well, we'd have to caveat and be like, I think it will. It says it's number six, but it's, you know, your mileage may vary. You might have to and try then if it. If we're and wrong, see. then we're on the hook for something that yeah. we are just not educated about. Yeah. But anytime you're swapping nib parts, especially if it's from a different manufacturer, just realize you're you're in experimentation mode and you're going to have some trial and error with whatever brand whatever model and likely avoiding your warranty yeah for that nib it's not like it violates the warranty for the whole pen but like if you have nib issues i mean or if you happen to read different 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 manufacturers yeah you know look at that a little differently some folks are like yes well the nib no you have messed with the nibs or no now we're not long we're no longer you know covering the nib but then if yeah, or usually you, like the writing but then, portion of But the then pen, some manufacturers, you know? they hear about any sort of manipulation and it's like... It depends. Yeah, so it's usually best to reach out to us and to our team if you're like kind of skeptical about it or looking to make a big investment or something like that. But, you know, it's fun to mess around with, but you're experimenting. All right. Next question we have is from Emily. Are pens supposed to come with converters? Sometimes I get one, other times I don't. Is this up to the brand or the seller? Drew, what is going on? Yeah, that's up to the brand and the Mm -hmm. distributor sometimes. And in very more rare circumstances, the retailer. Um, Most often than not, it is the responsibility and the uh, jurisdiction of the manufacturer, whether or not they are going to choose to provide a converter with a, obviously, cartridge converter Mm -hmm. pen. Generally, they do. Uh, It's more common to see a cartridge converter pen come with a cartridge than it is for it to not come with a cartridge, especially if it is anywhere above, I think, like probably the $50 range. It's pretty rare to see. Yeah, there's no like hard cutoff point. Some brands will, you know, are much more expensive and they still don't include a converter. It's more more common to see them on sub $50 pens. Yeah, I've seen. I would say it's fairly universal statement to me. Yeah, Yeah. so above that, you're probably going to get one, but we've seen pens that have been, you know, 300 plus that Mm -hmm. have not had converters. And we've taken issue with that. We've like, this should have a converter. Yeah. And we try to pass that along. Sometimes the distributor is like, yeah, we believe it too, but you know, the manufacturer doesn't. So we're going to take care of you. Sometimes the retailer in very rare circumstances draws a line and says, hey, we'll do it. Can you help us out in some way? But generally speaking, it's the responsibility of the manufacturer. And more often than not, you're going to get one at, you know, unless you're at the very, very entry level price mm-hmm. point. And even then, most of the entry level cartridge converter pens 
come with converters as well. It um, really depends. It really like all depends. of Paul, you know, pilots starting at the uh, Metropolitan and up do. The Kakuno does not. Um, right. The your your Lamy does. your Lamy Savarian All Star do not. They don't right. Platinum pens, you know, in that entry level range, do not. You got to mm-hmm. buy those separately. But mm-hmm. uh, once you get above fifty, you're you're pretty much. It's a pretty safe bet. Yeah, you're pretty much yeah. going to get one. But it's uh, still good to double check. It's still always you always want to double check, especially if you're buying a new pen. I'm, I'm assuming um, you always want to double check the product description or the website and and just verify. You know, pretty much every reputable retailer will say whether it comes with a converter or not. And usually, if it doesn't they're going to have an add-on option for you to buy. I mean, yeah. we have that for pens that don't come with a converter. Uh, we have the option, you know, in some fashion, whether it's a checkbox or whatever variation that it may look like, depending on the time <laughs> that you're looking at the website. Yeah, we try, we, try to, uh, we try to in some way provide a list of mm-hmm. um, applicable accessories there on the product page yeah. for you to take a look at and consider. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that most of the pens, I think all the pens we sell, we photograph what comes with that pen. Correct. So if you look at our images and you'll see like, you know, the first image that's just like the pen capped usually. And then some of the other images will show like it opened up or whatever. We'll show what comes in the box with a pen. Um, and if it's yeah. got a converter pictured there, then that means it comes with a converter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting, like, it, it, obviously, it's up to the manufacturer if they include a converter. Uh, sometimes what we've seen, especially with uh, more of the European pen companies, I mean, I from what I understand, I've never grown up in Europe, uh, but from what I understand from a lot of people who have is it's much more of a cartridge-centric oh, yeah. writing society. Yeah, I think that's pretty well so known. So cartridges are much more universal there, not the case in the U.S. So it's assumed more from the European manufacturers that a lot of people are going to use cartridges and the converter truly is kind of an, an afterthought, kind of an add on. But in the U S it's like overwhelmingly the people who are using fountain pens are using bottled ink. And so they want the converter. So, you know, there is a little bit of just, you know, having to convey that to some of our manufacturers that we deal with is like, no, like if we're, we're in the U S we're selling primarily to U S customers, like, they are assuming that a pen should have a converter. And if not, they have to add one on. So like when we do a new, like using Lamy as an example, right? Much more cartridge centric society over there. So for them, including a cartridge with every pen, you know, for if the majority of their pen sales are happening in Germany and parts of Europe, they would actually be wasting a lot of converters because not everybody is necessarily defaulting to using a converter. So they would be wasting a lot and it's a lot of extra and they would have to build that cost in. So they actually default to not including a converter on the lower end pens and then having it as an add-on. So, um, Sometimes manufacturers will default to not having it if, you know, probably the majority of who they see as their customer base globally is more cartridge centric. And then the maybe regional distributor, if you will, like say North American distributor may choose to either, you know, um, include it with it or not. And they'll build the price in kind of accordingly. Yeah. You might be surprised at how much the distributors actually work as far as packing things up. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of distributors that get things from the manufacturer, Germany, Japan, wherever, and things don't have boxes, they don't have accessories, and the distributor distributor actually packs everything up. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of work. They really do. They do more than you would typically think or maybe realize. Yeah. Some of that is just economically. Like if you think of like most pen boxes, uh, especially something like Lamy, using Lamy as a continued example here, their boxes, you know, they're cardboard for some of the smaller pens. Yeah. The so they can safari. actually, they can fold flat. So it's actually far more economical to ship them, you know, in like flat trays with all the pens and then box them in the location where they've been shipped to, as opposed to shipping all the pens in their finished boxes, which maybe wouldn't hold up as well in shipping or would take up more room and therefore cost shipping. It would definitely not you know, hold up as well. More. Yeah. Those boxes are, they're getting more frail by the year. <laughs> well, especially if like, you know, they're having to, you know, go on shipping containers and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, there, it is interesting how, how some of that stuff uh, really can vary a lot based on region as well. You think of like one manufacturer, it's one product, it should all be the same. Well, maybe not, maybe not globally. So it is kind of interesting. Uh, the pen itself will usually be somewhat similar, but you know, we've even seen that differently with like Pilot, for example. Some of their pens, they have the lower price pens, they have like the, the MR, Metropolitan. They ship it with the Namiki style 
you know, cartridge or converter in the U S and Japan, but they have the standard international on the same pen in Europe because they're so cartridge centric and they know that that's going to make a difference. So, um, that's why there's not like one standard everywhere. It is somewhat regional. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we've had times too, where we've had a pen that's been particularly expensive or something. And we're like, Oh, we really that we know that we're going to hear complaints about this not coming with a converter and we may choose just to offer it with a converter, you know, but that's, that's pretty rare. We don't do that a whole lot these days. It was more, um, you know, we had a few years ago and we've had it, we've had to be issues with, um, converter stock as well. Mm -hmm. That's the more frustrating thing is when a pen doesn't come with a converter and there's stock issues on the converter. So you're literally not even giving the option for somebody to get the converter with the pen. That really kind of stinks. But anyway, we try to take that into account. So for a brand like Lamy, going back to them again, if we are carrying the new Safari or All-Star or whatever, we'll also stop uh, stock up on converters because we know that a lot of them are going to you know, sell at the same time. But there you go. All right. I think we got that one answered, Drew. Yeah, we've got one more. And this one's one a little more. personal for you, Brian. Oh, and i got to explain myself a little bit so, here, don't yeah, I? This one's interesting. So uh, <laughs> Rabal asks, at the end of episode 41, during the tur- turkey hammock wrap-up, you know, essentially the last three minutes where we're just punchy and Nonsense. not saying anything uh a reference was made to brian's feelings about urushi as being similar to those about yellow jackets i've listened to all the pen casts start to finish thank you Rabal, and a large number of the old goulet q a videos and don't recall any mention of this please make urushi and brian's position or feeling about it a subject segment or question on the pen cast so he had said something about i kind of got him on a tangent about yellow jackets i, I said the buzzword and he just, just Okay, I'll, I'll tell you about the Yellow Jackets because it's getting to be that time of year where oh, yeah. the Yellow Jackets oh, are coming they're out. out. Oh, they're and, out right now. And Brian has had many run-ins. And I mm. just jokingly said, yeah, Yellow Jackets and Urushi, Brian's kryptonite. And what I don't want everybody to think is that you have something against Urushi. Like they're, it's somehow right. like something you personally dislike. No, not at all. Well, and I didn't help by saying like, oh, Namiki made a Urushi theme, or, right. or, or made a uh, yellow jacket themed. It's like we know what we're talking about, but yeah, the context no, actually, definitely It has nothing to do there. with Namiki in general. So, no, no, we love Namiki. We no, love Urushi. Yeah, it has to do with my like physical allergy. So I am one of the few people that I know that actually has a Urushi allergy. I've seen an allergist about it. Uh, I have, you know, usually uh, uh, it, comes, it comes out in poison ivy, poison oak, uh, these types of things, at least in the... North and America, you're North America. really allergic to poison ivy, poison I am oak too. Very allergic yeah. to it. Yeah, not like anaphylaxis kind of stuff. It's not life threatening, but contact dermatitis. Like I will flare up, and it'll take like three to four weeks for it to go down. It is awful. It hurts. It's painful. It's itchy. And it sucks for someone who spends so much time outside. Like I, we, should, tra- we should, we should trade because I it wouldn't. I wouldn't. I know even, yeah, it would affect your life literally zero unless it somehow finds its way inside. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm fine. No, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, no, so what that means for me in my actual life because I do like to go outside and play in the woods, and I actively have several plants on my property that have this wonderful oil in it and uh i have to know what it looks like and be careful when i'm working around it and i basically have to wear pants and long sleeves anytime i work in my woods which is wonderful this time of year when it gets nice and hot and i have to wear pants and long sleeves and i'm just super duper and humid sweaty here and in virginia like it's so humid. it's just so well, you can see how much i'm glistening right now but i am thick. quite sweaty at the moment it's thick out there it is so that was that was actually what the reference was about um so i have never had a reaction to a production I use that term loosely because they're only so much production manufactured. Um, but like a, a name brand, yeah, like Urushi, mainstream, yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never had an issue with uh, Namiki or um, Sailor or Tatcha or Platinum. Uh, it's only, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. I've had a couple of different independent Urushi pen makers who I've touched their product and had a reaction to it. And I, and I know this because I, it happened and I've had this happen to me several times on several occasions, like at pen shows. And yeah. Stuff. I remember. And I mean, you'll literally see like finger marks and like handprints on like my hands and face and everything. It's very obvious. I touched yeah. something and then I touched my like face and stuff. Now for, for those of you who don't know, Urushi is a lacquer often used in fountain pens and mm-hmm. lots of other traditional Japanese, you know, uh, housewares and things. Uh, it is 
an oil from mm-hmm. a uh, from the Yerushi tree, right? From a yeah. tree. So, uh, so it's so, a lacquer. It's an oil lacquer that uh, comes from this tree, and in its raw form, this oil is very toxic. There you um, go. Especially to somebody like me who's allergic to it. So it's in the same family as uh, uh, poison ivy. Yeah. I mean, it's literally the same active ingredient, urushiol, the oil. That is what um, people react to. Uh, not uncommon. A lot of people are. A lot of people react to poison ivy. I have a particularly strong. When I saw my allergist, he says I was literally the most allergic person he's ever met in his 35 years. And it is a very strange type of oil in that with urushi pens and or anything using this sort of lacquering craft they have it done layer over layer over layer and mm-hmm. these layers need to dry and cure and set mm-hmm. before the next layer can be put on yeah and if one layer even one layer isn't cured properly and it gets other layers put on top of it the oils from that one uncured layer will seep through every we'll other layer yeah. all of them like mm-hmm. the, it is tenacious mm-hmm. we we have seen times where um some namiki feeds are actually lacquered as well mm-hmm and we've seen those bubble up because I mm. think that the process for lacquering the feeds is probably different from the process of lacquering the rest I would of the imagine pens. So, yeah. um, so maybe the same care isn't taken, but we've seen it happen. Like know. even with Namiki, it can happen. So it's a very strange process, which also yeah. goes to show you why some of these pens are yeah. so expensive because and, the amount of work that it takes and the time that it takes is yeah. insane. Yeah. And, you know, kind of what Drew said, some of these pens can have 40 layers of lacquer on them. And if layer two was not cured properly, it could be four months later. Yep. And that layer could finally work its way up through. Uh, For what it's worth, though, I've never met anyone else who's had an allergic reaction to touching a finished Yerushi pen. I'm the only person I know that this has happened to. So, yay, it makes me special. But for a while there, I thought I was kind of crazy because I had this happen and I would talk to whoever the artist was I was working and they were like, they felt terrible and they were like baffled. They were like, people have been touching this pen all weekend or whatever at a pen show. But then I would talk to them. I'd be like, is this like something that happens all the time? They're like, no. Like one other person was like, I've met one person 10 years ago that this also happened to. And I'm like, great. So Good job, buddy. don't use me as an example. But anyway, that was what it was in reference to was, you know, I've had... I'm not allergic to yellow jackets, but yellow jackets are in the wasp family. And I had to research this because I I literally would get stung like on my wrist and then my whole hand would swell up like twice as thick as it normally is. And it's like, I can't bend my fingers and stuff. I've seen pictures. I was like, what is wrong with my hand? But then I would, so I got attacked several times by yellow jackets last year. They would also sting me on the head and the back and everything else. Through your shirts too. They they are tenacious. They're literally the worst. So they would sting me and I wouldn't have a reaction except on like one sting. So apparently whatever, because they're not like bees, bees, they sting you and the stinger stays in you and then they go and die. Um, Yellow jackets, they can sting you. They can sting you without venom or they can sting you with venom and they can sting you repeatedly over and over again and then just go about their business like they don't die. That's part of just why they're just a menace to society. Um, So because they can selectively sting, if they happen to sting you like on a particular like part of you that is more sensitive or whatever, mm. you know, they always seem to go for like my wrist or like, like on the bone, like really parts of just really painful. Um, so yeah, just, I guess particular times that they sting me and just like blast a lot of venom in that one spot. That's when I get the hand swelling thing going on. So I hate yellow jackets and, um, poison ivy as well. And both of them I'm around all the time. And I just kind of live with it. But as far as Urushi pens, you love it. it you're happy I love they're it. out there. Brian I love does it, not but have I, I love it, but I do them. not. I do not touch them at pen shows anymore. Yeah, because I've had uh, several instances of that happening now, and I'm like, it's, it's not worth the risk. Yeah, but for it's me, probably for me not you. It's probably not you. Probably not. Probably me. just him. If you've ever had an allergic reaction after touching a pen, let me know. It might be it, or go see your allergist. That's probably the better, more. Productive yeah, do that thing. first. Yeah. Don't let me know because I can't, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> I've, told do you, for you. I've told you everything I know about my situation, but hopefully nobody just else know, has it. Just know that he feels your pain. I do, indeed. All too real. All right, that's all we got for Q&As this week. Um, and now we got a tip of the week to share with you that's not related to an allergic reaction. Drew and I, we reached the bottom of the well on our tips of the week, and then we replenished that well a little bit. So... Um, little callback to several weeks ago, we were recording and I was like, oh, I thought of one and I want to say it, but I don't want to give it away yet. 
but I don't want to forget it either. So I like wrote down, just ignored you for like two minutes. You want to say it, down the you, idea. you also want to spray it. <gasps> I didn't want to say it or spray it. But actually. you do want to spray it today. Oh, I get where you're going with that. Good one. Uh, yeah, so I will be spraying it. So this is um, a very simple tip, but it's basically using compressed air when you're cleaning out your pens. Now, this is not like an absolute necessity by any means, but look, if you use computers or you're cleaning out your keyboard and you have a can of this compressed air, whatever brand, it doesn't really matter. Um, it actually can be kind of a handy tool when you're cleaning out your pen, especially if you're cleaning out a pen for storage. So if you're, it's not so much, it doesn't get the pen cleaner, but it can help to get the water out of the pen when it's just like kind of that standing moisture in the yeah. pen. That's kind of annoying. Yes, you can just leave it sitting out. But I don't know, if you're like me, I have pens at home, I have kids, you know, there's stuff getting put on the counters all the time. I really don't want to leave like my pen open and kind of disassembled. In and parts. you like your solutions to be as loud and forceful as possible. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, whenever you can like blast compressed air into <laughs> right. something, that's just a good time. So, uh, yeah, I, I had never heard of this tip from anybody. It was literally, I mean, I'm not going to say that I was like the first to come up with it, but. You and the other Brian like this tip I, a lot. I, I don't know. It's just like one of these little hack things. That both of like, you are very like. Uh, it's like a, a macgyver kind, yeah, of, a, yeah, kind of a tip. That yeah. fits. It's on brand, yeah. right? Um, so I just kind of came up with this, you know, to whatever. Maybe somebody else did first. I don't know. But if they did, I didn't see it. This is just something I kind of daydreamed. Um, but, you know, Drew, Drew and I personally have had an experience where we're either like trying to clean out pens, maybe to put back on the bottom shelf, or we have our own pens that we're cycling through and we know we're not going to use it for a while. So we're going to store it. Don't really want to leave it ton of water sitting in there, especially like vacuum filling pens, like some of the like Twisby Vac 700, like that type of stuff. Even if it's just like spritz, like, you yes. know, vacuum fillers do that thing where you clean them and you're you done clean it, and you, then you're you like the paper look, towel on the feed and you're like yep i got all that totally moisture out you of there the, you put the piston down just to just to finish it off and you just get that nice little it. and then it's like and then the whole thing is just covered God, in you, mist on the yes, inside bluish mist just it's enough just really that, that you yeah. know that this is fine but if it dries <laughs> it's gonna leave blue specks exactly why can't this just be gone so that basically is where this thing comes in all or right sometimes it can just be a time saver like me personally you know, especially when I'm like cleaning converters or other things like that. Oh, we've got Basically, that converter back here again. Yeah, you like oh, this thing. No, man. It, no, it's nothing to be afraid of, Drew. You can all disassemble right. this thing all you want. Maybe you don't even need the compressed air because you can just disassemble it and get a Q-tip. Oh, I see. Swap, okay. All you right. know, but just in case you don't want to do that every time. So I have a I have a converter here and I have some water inside. And I think I actually, Drew, I might go to uh, close-up mode here. Okay. And uh, we'll we'll see what this looks like close-up. It's going to be a very quick one, though. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, but basically you can use the compressed air to essentially kind of like blast out the uh, leftover moisture that you have um, in your converter or inside your pen, uh, particularly if it's a pen where you're, it's a piston or vacuum pen where, you know, maybe you can pull the nib off and you could get something in there, but you can't quite get a Q-tip or you don't want to necessarily have to like roll up a paper towel and like try to just like, get it in there it's just kind of annoying so yeah i'm so guessing the uh the, like this the straw attached to the compressed air is handy for these uh it's kind of essential to it honestly um so i have um maybe i should record huh so i have this converter here so i just filled it with water and dumped it back out uh to be representative of maybe i've just cleaned it there's a little bit of water left in there i like try to shake it out and all that kind of stuff okay good but it's a lami one so it's got a little extra moisture up back here behind the little the it's very little, upsetting the little insert very upsetting so if you have compressed air with the little straw um, and this is a pretty short straw some of them have longer ones but you just take and you kind of blast it you just do a little short burst you don't have to go nuts but you kind of get that in there and then you know basically look at that it's good to go and i probably did that more than it really needed to and look there's gonna be a little bit of water left in there but you know, if I'm trying to leave a converter out and it, it's going to be sitting there or I would I would totally ink this back up with something new. Oh, absolutely. It's ready like, to go. I'm not worried about that at all. But if I was going to maybe put this pen away, I would do this, like go have lunch or something. And then I would reassemble the pen and put it back. I don't have yeah. to like, leave it out overnight and then worry about the nib getting, you know, a, a book put on top of it or something. If you live in my house or maybe socks, socks or apple cores, they just end up everywhere. Um, so, yeah, this is really handy. You know, if you don't want to deal with the Q-tips or the paper towels or whatever and having to like roll them up and get in there and then they get wet and you got to roll up a new corner and get in, you know, if you're doing pen after pen after pen, compressed air can be a very handy trick for just getting that little water out. So that basically is, uh, that's the tip right I there. I dig that. 
So I dig that. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing like, would I go and buy a can of compressed air just for this? Probably not. It's not really worth that. But if you happen to already have it because you're cleaning out your keyboard keys or whatever, you know, just grab that thing next time you're cleaning pens and see where it might be helpful to use. See, I need to buy some right now. I've got tons of things in my house I would love to, you know, blast with some compressed air, including my keyboard. Yeah. Like I'm the sure little cracks gross. and crevices in the car too, like in the in the door oh, yeah. where the locks are. Like I, I would, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at that right now. I'm like, oh my God, I need to clean that part of my car so, so bad. Gross. So gross. Right around the gear shift too. Oh yeah. Always disgusting. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Cars are nasty. Yeah. Especially now with all the pollen and everything. We should we should mm. carry these in the store so I can get a discount on them. Yeah, some some Droule air compressed air. Hey, branding <laughs> is everything. I mean, I don't know. We'll look into it. But anyway, <laughs> the only the only caveat I'll say with this, so it's it's using compressed air, but it uses uh how do they what is the propellant in this thing? I forget what it is. Um, I don't know if it's the propellant itself or if it's just the nature of it. I think it's not actually the propellant. I think it's the the nature of when you have a compressed air and then you're releasing it, it comes out cold. Yeah. So sometimes, especially if you turn the can upside down. Oh, absolutely. You can literally like blast like frozen yes. moisture don't out of the thing. Don't turn it upside down. So just be careful not to blast frozenness into your pen. Cause that, yeah, or like, onto your skin would not be good. because yeah. it's not good for your skin either. Yeah, I mean, there's like warnings and stuff on the bottle or whatever. So just use common sense. But if you do it like I just demonstrated and just have like little tiny spritz and you're holding the can, you know, mostly upright, you should be okay. So just be aware of that. But other than that, it should be a nice little handy trip. Tip, Look at that. Little tip. All right. And then uh, moving along, we have the Pen Spotlight, which this week is going to be the Diplomat Elox. All right. Now, Drew, we were like, oh, what color should we show? And we we're like, oh, well, we have the orange. And the blue is still coming. Blue in, is still coming. Let, let, let's <laughs> so. talk. Let's talk a little bit. If you haven't yet seen the packaging that Diplomat uses, like just let's just pay attention. It's to pretty this. cool. This is a. It's metal. It doesn't. I was expecting this to sound more like metal. It'll sound like metal once I take it off. Once you though. take it out and you can let it ring. There you go. There we go. That sounds like metal. So you've got a metal sleeve on top of a plastic a paper box. A nice little flappy do here, it's and like then here style. is. The Elox. The there you go. Lots and of rings happening. Brian, my first thought okay. is that this looks like the Diplomat Arrow. It's a general shape of an arrow. Same clip, right? So if you are uh, arrow friendly, then you are probably going to lean friendly towards uh, the Elox as well. So same general shape, weight, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's mainly a style difference that you're looking at. Yeah, instead of having kind of flutes, flutes yeah. going up and down the mm -hmm. barrel you've got engraved lines yeah now one could say rings one could say rings uh one could might also say that this is called the elex rings isn't it um that's a good question i don't know i will look that up so this pen looks like orange anodized aluminum mm -hmm. but then it's black on top of that so how could they make a black pen but when they grind into it mm. it's orange underneath that's a great question what sort of witchcraft is going so on it here? is called ring black orange a ring ring well this thing is lying because i see a multitude of rings i don't know what you're talking about maybe maybe they're just saying one of these rings is the like card the says main moops. one i'll tell you okay I'm gonna, so i'm so, to get that reference because you don't watch seinfeld i mean i i I Drew refuses to enjoy. I don't refuse. Things. It just hasn't. It's like Point Break. It hasn't come my way yet. I've been on Drew for like five years I know. about watching Seinfeld. I know. And you know what? You turn me on to community, so I should trust you. You really should. I don't but know what your problem is. <laughs> I am not the problem in this situation. <laughs> okay. So, all right. The underlayer yes. is orange aluminum. Yeah. How? How? How is it like an orange pen and they just coat it in black? Like what right. kind of magic is happening here? And like this is it's not are just you asking me hypothetically and you know. No, no, I don't. I want to know. I want to know. Because you you can't just have orange aluminum. It no. has to be anodized. Correct. So did they they you and you can't just anodize rings. You have to anodize the whole thing. Correct. So they had to do the whole thing in orange and then coat it in other layers. It's my understanding that they that they engrave the rings, and I really hope I'm speaking accurately here because I don't 100% remember. But I believe that they cut the rings, they anodize it in orange, and then they have to essentially, like you said, like seal off or block off the, the ring part. Oh. And then seal the whole thing in black. 
Oh. And so it's- So they like tape off the ring somehow? Yeah, I don't what? know the exact process because it is proprietary, but it's a multi-step anodization process. And yeah, these are the same price as the- uh, uh, are these the same price as the? Um, they're more than a regular arrow. They're more than a regular arrow. They okay. are because it's a lot of extra. Oh, like, I'm thinking of the. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the um um the you arrow can, stripes, the black yeah. stripes. So, that one is the same price. So that's the same process. Yeah. To this, so to do a a several color with like multi depth kind of thing, the process is ultimately similar. You're having to basically anodize it twice and have all this like extra. That's taping, crazy. Taping off of something. That's back. crazy. I don't actually know how they do it because this is part of their magic. You don't see this no happening with you many really other don't. Pens. Do you find? Do you feel like it feels uncomfortable? Like the the rings are like it's it's metal that is etched. So do you feel like the rings like dig into your grip or anything like that? Because when I first saw this online, that was my first thought. I was like, this thing's gonna feel like sharp and painful. I mean, I feel it, but. It's not anything that's bothersome to me. When I first picked it up, I'm like, this is going to be bothersome because when I'm just like, you know, fondling it, it feels funky. But then when you actually hold it as though you're about to write, I don't think it does. You know, I would say if you are, I don't know, if you if you move your fingers a lot when you write, I could see that like maybe but who does rubbing that? back and forth. I who writes know. like this? I, I don't like know. A, like, a, like, a, like a squid going boop, boop, I'm boop, just saying, boop, boop, maybe boop. some people do. Then I could see it maybe being a little bit, you know, something noticeable. It's not like it's going to like wear away on your skin or anything like that. Um, I mean, I, I, I can feel it as you're mentioning it, but it wasn't something that as I picked it up, I was like, oh, this is going to yeah. be a problem. I feel it when I'm just, you know, playing around with it, but then when sure. I'm actually holding it. Well, you're not actually gripping that part. You know, right. the, the yeah. grip itself feels like a regular it's, arrow. Right. So that's not really bothersome at all. Um, you know, I think it's just if you're if you're sensitive to textures, and you don't like that in general, then it's probably not going to be your favorite pen. Mm -hmm. Like Rachel's kind of, specific about the but textures But if you don't like pens. that, you probably wouldn't like any arrow. Um, because I don't know. All, all the arrows are bumpy metal. I mean, they are, but these, these, the rings here feel a little bit sharper. Yeah, they are. They like are. Like the regular flutes. Sure. The, the other flutes are bigger and they're going in the other direction. So it's not like you're, hand, you're, you're not handling the pen around this way as much. You're more like moving your hand up and down this way. So you, it's more noticeable. Here's another question response, for you. I guess. Because I'm just going all over the place here. You really Do are. Do you okay. think that this pen in this style mm -hmm. is more broadly appealing than the standard arrow style because this you could say that this looks less industrial i don't know because um, the, the arrow is very very kind of brutalistic looking you know very you know uh that's a it's a style of architecture uh, I, I trust you um it, it's very just i don't know really kind of uh industrial looking this one looks a little bit more modern mm -hmm. a little bit more sleek the, the other you know what the other one looks like it looks like a gun barrel yeah like the regular arrow because like it looks like a fluted gun barrel that's kind of what it reminds me of yeah this one doesn't look like i think it's a little more sleek it's a little bit it's a little more uh it's hard for me to say i don't have a strong feeling yeah. one way or the other about which one is okay more universally appealing well then i'm forced to make you have a strong feeling it's hard to say. Brian, oh, I mean, no, no. I'm, I'm going to ask you a new one. Oh, okay. That I have no doubt you will this have a strong like feeling Brian about. This is like interview hour or something I'm, the I'm curious. I'm curious. Well, the Elox is a relatively... We've only got this one. It's All right, here's newer, what I want to know. Okay. We've got a blue one coming out in May. Yes. Which one's better? I mean, is that even a question? Yes, it is. Because Which I, one is better? All right. So your answer is blue then. Let me let me pull up the blue. They I haven't, haven't seen the blue Brian, we have a swatch on the site. Gonna, you can just click on the blue swatch. I really should know that. We yeah, have, I didn't do that. We make it easy for you, Brian. We do. On the Goulet Pen Company so, website. I need. I really need to see it in person to make a definitive statement because blues can look different. You think there's a chance this you won't a, like the blue better? It looks a bit on the periwinkle side, which I'm not as in love with. You really think there could be a possibility that you could like this one better than the blue? Be honest. I don't know. The orange is such an iconic arrow color. And the black and orange is pretty tight, but no, it's almost certainly going to be a blue. Don't, don't, it's going to be a blue. Don't but this act is, like... But this is a really cool I, color. No, it is. And really I, cool I actually color. do like it better than the blue. But this thing you're doing where you're like, oh, you know, maybe. I thought for sure I'm getting... I say pick blue pen or orange pen and you're it's still... Only, it's only because if I see a blue that I get my hopes up about and it comes out and it looks like <laughs> peri, it looks periwinkle, then I'm just like, oh, man. Like, that's just like... I don't... It's like almost there. It's yeah. like more of a letdown because it's so close. Yeah. As opposed to just being a completely different color. 
So that's the only reason Fair why enough. I'm kind of okay. on the fence about it. All like right. I'm pretty specific about which blue I love. And if it's a little too purple or whatever, then I'm just like, oh, nice try. So yeah. So what this. we have on our website right now is the stock image provided to us by the distributor. Yeah. So we don't know. Yeah. Based on this image, it looks rad. It looks like it's going to be amazing. It does look cool. It does um, look cool. But, but I, I will say that I'm not as big of a fan of the blue and black because I think the blue gets no. lost a little bit in the black. The orange contrasts the contrast more. more. And, yeah. I, and I really, really like that. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think the orange, for whatever reason, I don't know why it feels like it's kind of connected to this style of pen, but I feel I mean, like our, it is. That's our top arrow color is that. Why orange. is that? I don't know. It just looks so good. I, yeah, I agree. But it's just not every day an orange happens to be the best seller in a fountain pen model. No, in fact, that might be the only pen we sell where the orange is the best color. I mean, like the most popular. In, in, there are some times where, you know, in the past, I know orange, especially orange celluloid was a really big deal when Delta had their orange celluloid mm. and that they tried to replicate that. There, there yeah, was, Delta there, was known for that. There was yeah. a Conklin that, um, like the Orange Knights or whatever. I don't know if we still have that one, but that one was so. pretty good. But yeah. every now and then, Orange just looks good. kills it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You like that one? I do. I do. And um, I... Do you want to see this one in brown, don't you? That's what you're thinking about. No, I don't, because the brown's going to blend in too much with the black. I no, like what that. If the, what if the black part could be brown instead? If the black part could be brown, would I would good want with brown, though? everything. Oh. No, green would look good. Um, brown and green, okay. Brown and green look good. Go, tree, you go tree looking, earthy very thing. earthy. Yep, honestly, brown, brown like a beige, like a like a coffee, like a mocha type. Of that brown. would look good. I honestly, um, brown and uh, light blue actually look really brown good and together. Light blue. Yeah, okay, I yeah, see I, that. I really yeah, like that. Yeah. Like think about like a pair of light blue jeans with some nice brown boots. Like that's a that's a solid combination right there. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. You, you can do this in brown. Absolutely. I'm so, they yeah. Have a, they um, have made a brown arrow before, you know? Don't you have one? Or is that one of the ones? Brown arrow is like... my superhero name. <laughs> that is fitting. <laughs> All right. Do you actually have a brown arrow, though? I can't remember if you do. I do. You do have one. Yeah. I do. You acquired it. I acquired it. Yes. It was. The, it's the one with the funky barrel that... That's right. We think it's a rollerball barrel, that's so it doesn't right. fit all the, right. the, cart, right. the converters. There you go. But it is fine. I still have one, and I'm happy about it. There you go. All right, good stuff. So there you go. That's the Elox. You can check that out. Uh, we have that in the black and orange now. There is a blue one coming in May sometime. Don't have an exact date, but be on the lookout. May is right around the corner. I just realized, like, oh, May, that's whatever. No, that's literally, like, in two days after this video publishes. What yeah. in the world? What in the world's happening? I'm freaking out, man. Too. I'm freaking out too. But not as much as we're about to freak out because we're getting to the least relevant portion of the pencast, the what's happening in our lives. All right, Drew. Do you want to know what's happening in my life, Brian? I see some things. Don't on, spoil on your it. To-do list. I'm not going to spoil don't it for them. Spoil it. It's already been spoiled for me. Well, I'm talking. Well, you don't know what these are about. I don't there, know what they're there about. Could, there could be hidden hidden nuggets hidden here. Hidden gems, yeah. All right. Well, this All weekend right. I went to Colonial Williamsburg with my Ooh. wife and son. Okay. And uh, we realized that our passes from last year were expired, so we did not go into the museum, Whoops. did not go to see the blacksmith <laughs> or any of the fun stuff. Did you not realize that it's like a different year now we, than last dude, year? Dude, it was close. It was April. It, oh, they, it's like... They expired like April 12th. Yeah, we were is just... Is it just like a year from when you buy them? Yeah. Or is it... Oh, interesting. So yeah. I think of like theme parks, you buy it for the, like the calendar year. So it's like, if you buy a season pass to like, you know, Kings oh, Dominion, so, Bush oh, Gardens, I see, I see. like that kind of thing, you're buying it for that calendar year. And oh. then as soon as, no, no, it's, three, as, soon as it's closed days. for the winter, yeah. you're like, well, Williamsburg a, doesn't ever close. Oh, that's true. So. It's, so it's not really a theme park. No, no. It's a historical, yeah. you know, preservation zone thing. i don't know <laughs> historical uh, preservation zone i don't know but they've got like some of <laughs> some you have to have passes to you know go see the blacksmith making nails and stuff like that so we didn't okay. do any of that but uh, it's okay. still, it's still really pretty it was a beautiful day on saturday mm. so we walked around oh yeah it was gorgeous moseyed about yeah i did have yeah. to wear the hat because you know yeah i i, I have an exposed situation uh -oh. these days so gotta uh -oh. protect myself you know you are nearly 40, i don't know aren't if, you? i don't know if you know about this but i i have fair skin so do you? I do. I, I had do. never noticed. I don't before. talk about it a lot. Okay. I don't talk about it a Fair lot. Enough. Fair but enough. Uh, us fair-skinned individuals have to be mindful of okay. um, the evil radiation ball of death in the sky. <laughs> so 
protected myself with my Walt Disney Pictures hat. It's got like the old logo, like the... Okay. Da, 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 what kind of hat is this? I'm picturing like a safari hat. Oh, it's like, like a, a dad hat. It's like one of those shallow yeah. things, the floppy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Total dad hat. Oh, yeah. Um, but that was fun. Very, very pretty. We just walked around and looked at the gardens and such. Nice. I went to Food for Thought, got my uh, shrimp and grits. Of course. You better. I have to. You better. I have to. So that well, was, What are you doing if you're not going to your favorite restaurant to get not, your favorite meal? Not living my best life. That's, That's right. That's exactly right. And I went to the outlets in Williamsburg. Oh, yeah. And they have a Converse outlet. And I had a Ooh. gift card for my wife for my birthday. Mm. She had originally given me. Uh, Drew gift- likes to wear shoes that aren't really shoes. They're just they're, like. They are some of, of the best shoes. With hard rubber on the bottom. That's what he likes. Mm-mm. I hassle Drew out his shoes. They're the he best. loves them. Though. They're the best shoes. They work for you. Yes, I, I pretty they much. Do not it's, work it's, for it's, me. it's all I wear. It's Converse All Stars. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to make my own, and I talked about this on the pencast. Make your about, own. About um, yeah, how I could oh, dye, like custom design, design. or yeah. something. Oh. So that's what the gift card was for. But then I go to the outlet. I'm like, or I could just get three pair of shoes for the I price mean, of this, and yeah. that's what I did. I got leather converse all-stars leather Brian. converse leather. three pair of leather converse i got wow. some blue leather ones some green leather ones with like boot soles like yeah Interesting. yeah gore-tex huh. man wow and then winter all-stars so, so black leather okay white fronts like normal and then inside is all like fluffy and cozy Interesting. Yeah. Are they like slippers or are they No, they're just normal shoes. They're normal high top shoes, but they're 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 for winter. So you know how normally they have like the holes in like the side. The vent holes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've got the, the vent holes. For all your, but, yeah. um, they're not uh waterproof at all. And I wear right. them year round, which is kind of stupid. So <laughs> this way I can be I, well, I'm not you wear, stupid. You wear pants year round too, so which you is know. smart. Mm. why buy half pants no comment anyway um <laughs> hashtag why buy half pants right no don't do that <laughs> uh so that was great i uh, did some gardening we did uh i've i did my raised bed now i'm moving into the grow bags so okay. um, just uh, kind of felt bags you fill with a bag of soil and we we're doing snow peas in one and did the carrots in the other still got a few more that we want to fill up but we're starting okay. that uh, archer did the uh Archer he planted both of them actually he's trying to get a badge from the wild kratz creature hero foundation we need to check some things off the list we built a birdhouse we're doing the planting uh gotta do some more things so he can get another badge i did he wants to be a creature hero uh wild kratz are great man did your were your kids ever into those they missed that by a little bit they they are they are fantastic i also hate bugs they hate the outdoors generally speaking so feel like they wouldn't earn a lot of badges. Well, he's not really into bugs but either, but he my, loves uh, animals, like crazy about my, animals. My nephew friggin' loves wild crats. Oh, they're great. Like, we know. went to see them live when they came to Richmond. They're fantastic. I love the wild crats. They've been doing it for friggin' ever, too. I, they have. They? they have. Yeah. They're legit, man. They're yeah. legit. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, oh, the puppy's doing well. Yeah. The puppy's doing well. Mm-hmm. Uh, still on the antibiotics for the uh, UTI. I think he's okay. doing well. He hasn't peed inside today, all okay. day. I all went right. home at lunch. All right. He's doing okay. We're taking him out like every three seconds, just in case. <laughs> we see him sniffing around. We're like, yep, yeah, take him outside. Yeah. Um, but uh, he's good. Still howls a lot at night. And not, really? Neither of our other two corgis ever did that. Hmm. Interesting. So he gets in the crate fine. Like, hey, get in your crate. Whoop. It goes right in. Yeah. But then as soon as you shut the door, hmm. so. Interesting. Yeah. And those ears are all the way up though right now. Yeah. They're huge. Wow. It's like the size of his head. So <laughs> all is well there. And then uh, also this weekend, I committed way too much time to helping my son clean his room. And I need to talk to you about this, Brian, because oh boy. you have kids and you have one son. This is the blind leading the blind okay, right, right here. Hold, Let me hold tell it. You. No, you have to be able to help me here, man. Oof, okay. Okay. I'll try. Legos. Oh, and, 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 okay. And, and, and like, okay, they don't just build the Legos and like set them up. They build them and then play with them and take them apart. And yeah. like you uh-huh. have parts of the Legos that are now off the set. Yep. This room, Brian, was just, you couldn't do anything in it. And it took so long. Do you and remember I, being a child? Do you remember having an organized room in any fashion? No, but I don't. Like, but I, it was never like, I, I, I could always walk to my bed. I mean, like, I don't know how kids do it. I mean, oh so my God. Joseph, okay, so I have two kids, right? Joseph is 12. He has the Lego situation going on. Do you make him do all of it himself or do you help? Um, he's pretty good. So, okay. Well, let me caveat this. Yes. Joseph's pretty good about keeping things off his floor, but every other vertical surface that he has is absolutely just 
covered with Legos. Yeah. I mean, like his room especially mm-hmm. is like if you bump his dresser, like 400 Lego things fall off. Because I was it's helping all piled him. Piled on top of his dresser. I was helping him set up the Legos like neatly. Yeah. And I had to take that into consideration. Like, no, yes. all of this crap is going to fall when you shut oh, these yeah, drawers. We like, so we, years ago, when Joseph was like, it was pretty evident, like, yeah, he's going to be like a Lego kid. Like, that's like going to be his thing. I was like, okay, cool. We looked at Pinterest. I, he has like the closet door <sighs> that has like the raised panel, you know, kind of thing going on. So I saw this cool little design thing where you paint it like to be like Lego brick oh, colors. Yeah, yeah. And I like cut out little wooden discs to look like the studs. That's neat. And I like made his raised panels into like Lego bricks, right? So I did stuff like that. We got him this like little cubby center thing. And on the top of the cubbies, we bought like the Lego, like the big plates. And we just covered the whole thing in plates so that he can like build stuff on top of the dresser. And we were like, oh cool, he can like play on top of it. Well now it's just like 100% covered in things that he yeah. builds. But he builds the things and he maybe doesn't really want to take them all apart. Right. But then they just kind of pile and pile and pile and pile. And right. Pile. And I got and at Archer, some point we're just like, dude, we got to do something. When we moved this. into the house, I bought him a low loft <sighs> bed. So it's not quite a bunk bed, but it, okay. it, he's got a little ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then underneath. It's like it, a little play area, it has, right? Or well, it's, it's, it's storage or something. You, you, yeah, there's storage there. You okay. can go under it if you want to. And then there's a yeah. desk that you can pull out. Nice. Okay. But. When oh. the desk gets pulled out. Yeah, it ain't, ain't going back. Right? Oh, yeah. That's like, that's now a vertical surface <laughs> that's covered in Lego bricks. So and, that was yeah. like the thing. I'm like, this is supposed to be yeah. your Lego assembly zone. Oh, but then yeah. he assembles it and then uses it to pull more Legos on. I'm yep. like, you can't, you can't build anything now. Right. You got no place to build. So yeah. then that's all messed up. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a playroom and that's messed up. Yep. So then he gets a new Lego set and now he's on the dining room table yep. building that. I'm like, no, this is not... Yep. The point. There are times when I, get, I come, I come inside and I look at the kids and I'm like, kids, there are literally Legos on every Everywhere. vertical surface oh. within sight in this house, everywhere. And so I'm like, grab a bin, go collect all your Lego junk, and go put it back up oh. in your room, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's a thing. So this is just it's the way thing. it is. It's kind, of, yeah, it's all kind right. of just a lifestyle thing, and it's it's tough too because like. You know, I have some Lego stuff for myself. I like Lego Technic, right? And Lego Technic, like the pieces are a little more specific. They got to like function and do stuff. So I'm not like building custom stuff. It's a little harder to do with Technic. Yeah. Like props to those who do, but I'll build the kit and I'll have it out and build the alternate kits and stuff like that. But it's mostly like I build it and it's kind of set there. You know, but Joseph loves to like, he'll get a set, but he likes the unique pieces and stuff that come in the set. And then it just like, gets broken apart and it just morphs into his blob of Lego tubs and stuff like that, which makes me cry a little inside. Yeah, you said he had like the Millennium Falcon at some point. Oh, he's and, got Benny's spaceship. He's got and it's all Millennium gone. Falcon and all these beautiful oh, sets that are now, they're all still there somewhere. Their, oh. their spirit is in the house there somewhere, oh. but all the pieces are now so what do, what do you, integrated. Before we move on, just one last thing. <laughs> do, what do you do for uh, room cleaning incentives? Uh, nothing works. Literally nothing Dirty. works in There's our house. No one here. Yeah. Oh. Our kids are special. Like they have some unique things. I'm not exactly gifted in the organization area myself. So it yeah. definitely is a little bit of like, I don't know what to do because I can't even clean we my tried own stuff. Like, we tried like, okay, Sunday afternoon, yeah. weekends closing up. Sunday afternoon is going to be our room cleaning time. And we've yeah. never been able to stick to it. So the thing that I've helped, for what it's worth, I have no one surefire like set it and forget it advice. But what helps is breaking it down into different tasks, right? So like for us, I don't care if the whole room is like clean, organized, put away, whatever, because my kids will fight back a little bit. My daughter especially, because she's she's a very creative mind and she the, the world is her workspace, right? Okay. Um, so with her, it's, I, I explained to her, I'm like, I just want to be able to like vacuum your floor. Yeah. Like I don't care about your like top of your dresser and all this kind of stuff. I don't care if your books are organized. Can you just like put all the books on the bookshelf? Right. Just I don't care. Give what me a organization. vacuum path. Yeah. I want a vacuum path. I want to not like trip and die when I'm trying to like change your light bulb in your room. Or crush your thing and then yeah. be blamed that I've done something wrong exactly. somehow. So I explain to them like what is the goal and then I try to break it down. And actually what I found with my kids is it helps to write it down like onto like a small whiteboard or something. Mm. You know, this works not just in their rooms but just in general. Because what will happen is like Rachel or I will tell them we'll list off like seven different things that we need to do on a Saturday. And the kids are like entirely overwhelmed. But if I make it into a list, it's almost like magic. Like they want to see the things 
on that list done. And then I'm like, here's the list. I've so, never done that. Yeah, no, try no. that, okay. try that. That's been the one thing that has been the most successful with helping my kids to just do their household chores is to write it down on a list. Okay. And especially on a whiteboard that they can actually cross off. And then if there's some kind of incentive to it, that's like a positive thing, like, hey, we're gonna whatever, go to Target and probably buy more Legos. You know, if it's like, hey, we're gonna go to Target, but before we do, we gotta make sure that we have these things done on the list. And I try to break it down into reasonable things. That's like, put the books back on the bookshelf, put the thing, I can't, you can't just put clean room, because that's not clear enough as to what the end goal yeah. is with the kids. But if no. you can just write down the specific tasks and make them something that takes like five to 10 minutes to do, and they can like see the end in sight and then cross something off the list, that's I'll try the much greater thing. likelihood. Yeah, that's oh. been, I thought I thought that felt a little gimmicky at first, but as soon as I did it, it was like, I gave the kids like a Red Bull and they went and just went and cleaned stuff. I was like, what? Okay. Who are these children? There you go. See, I'm that's like what I needed. That's yeah. what I needed. There's your life hack. Some, there you go. Hopefully it works, but that's. Well, I spent a lot that's of time helping him clean everything up. And then Sunday night we went over some friend's house. And for so, some reason, my friends have a giant inflatable pickle that Archer loves to play with. Okay. Is it like um, a pool float or just I, like a. I don't know. I don't know, but it's okay. a pickle. And Archer thinks it's hilarious. He always takes it out of the closet and it starts swinging it around, punching it in the air. <laughs> sounds pretty funny. And we're leaving, right? And okay. he grabs a pickle. I'm like, what are you doing? Stop. Put put that back. And he's like, uh, they, they said I could keep it. And I was like, <laughs> oh. What? Yeah, mom said I could keep it too. I was like, did y'all say he could keep this? And they're like, yeah. So he's just standing the stand. There's the big smile. Like, I get to keep the pickle. I get to keep the pickle. And, and now I'm you're like, like, just. You're like, where are we gonna put this? We spent all pickle? this time <laughs> trying to figure out how, where to put all of the crap mm. in his room, and all of a sudden, let's bring home a giant inflatable pickle. Absolutely, it's on the living room couch right now. Wow! So there you go. Now you get a big pickle, pickle. in your living room. That's exciting. Yeah, it only gets worse. He was so happy though. See, that's the thing. Yeah, the kids get happy, and then you're like, all right, it's I fine. can deal with this. I have your pickle. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. What, when's the last time you got that excited about something that dumb? I only get excited about dumb things, actually. No, that's a good point. Yeah. You're a bad example. <laughs> but, uh, all right. I have a segue what's happening question for you. Okay, Joe, bring it on. Because I realized that last week I said, oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your yellow ink experience. Oh, yeah. And then we totally never revisited it. Yeah. And it's now been like three pen casts. And, and we no, haven't all talked about the yellow ink. To be fair, no one on the comments has asked about no it one either. Cared. So, no, no one cares. And then after the pen cast, I was like, Drew, I totally forgot to ask you about the yellow ink. And you're like, oh, yeah, I've got it right here. And he like all his notes and everything. Yeah. And he's like, I actually did play with them. And I was yeah. like... This is like the least productive way to go about doing this. I know. We should be talking about pen things. But no, I've really enjoyed it. I used Sailor Ink Studio 770. I've used Diamine Sunshine Yellow. And okay. I used Roarer and Klingner Helianthus. That's a good one. And all three were great. Did and you, I still, I still have all three. Did you use Amberty, Amberty? No, because it's not chance? yellow. <sighs> it's brown. It's no, come on now. It's, it's more, a usable yellow. That's it's, what it should be called. All right. Now, all of these have a fair share of orange in them. Um, it has so to. We, it we has, has to. It has to, A yeah. pure yellow is not going to look like anything on white no, paper. No, but, but I think that... Um, I think that... Uh, I'll say 770 is closer. Was that the standout? Was that that, well, that one was more of a pure yellow than the other two. Okay. What about Di think, Diamond Sunshine yellow? Did you use Sunshine that one? was fantastic. Yeah. yeah that was um, a good so one. Both, okay. both Sunshine and Helianthus had a little bit more orange to them. So okay. they did look better. Okay. Um, more legible. But better just means you can actually read what yeah. you wrote. <laughs> but, but, but 770 was more yellow and it still was pretty legible. Now okay. I had it in a fine nib so it was a little less legible. But I think okay. if I put it into a stub... It would look perfect. I'm keeping them all inked up because I'm actually really enjoying writing with them. Wow! So I'm not gonna. I'm not rushing to empty them. Um, and you only have three pens inked up at a time, right? That's right. So you have 100% yellow ink. Yes. In your pen collection right now. Now I do have. Uh, I do have a um, a desk pen. That's a 3D printed pen I bought on Etsy or uh -huh. Instagram or something. Okay. I keep. I do keep that on my desk. Oh, so, so it's a fourth pen, is what you're it, saying? It kind of because sometimes it's dried out and not effective but uh yeah right now it does have ink <laughs> well, in well that's it. like half my collection right now right I, I but a lot of times i won't bring my pens into the office so i'll have that okay. one so i always have at least a pen okay. so that one's kind okay. of like my my floater um okay uh if so i do have another pen that i can use legibly if i need to so Fair enough. there is technically a fourth pen okay yeah but 
But that it's, one, it doesn't sound like you rotate that one in and out. No, I don't. So it's not I, really, part, it's not really I, in the same league. Well, as no, because I keep three pins inked up, so I don't have to clean more than three. Okay. This pen, I just keep plugging in a new cartridge of Prime There's Reserve never... Naples Blue, <laughs> just over and okay. over and over again. All right. Um. So it's it, you don't clean it basically. No, no. So you don't. I just okay. keep refilling it. All right. Um. Yeah. So I think on a technicality, you could call that a fourth pen. Yeah. It's a fountain pen that you keep inked up. Yeah. You just don't treat it like the others. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Fair enough. I do that with most of my pens. So um, <laughs> you're ahead of me. Yeah. Cool. All right. Good. Well, I'm glad you did. Glad you. I'm sorry no one cared enough to ask you about it and hold you accountable to it. But it's okay. Drew is determined. Drew is determined to use his yellow inks, yeah. and he did. No and one he, asked me to do it. He I has just experience did it on my own, to share. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know that feeling. That's like all my food challenges that I give to myself that no one asked me, and they're like, "No, Brian, really, don't do that." And I'm like, "No, now I must do it." Well, to be <laughs> fair, I, I have been responsible for a couple of them. Like the cowtail thing was me, so you can blame that, that one was, on me. Yep, yep. That was not self imposed. And then the uh, the tacos were a group effort with me, you and Sam. That was a group effort. I definitely yeah. was like, I was. You, you know, definitely. I was egging that one. You were you were I all was, into I it. I was a very willing participant for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. yeah, Brian wants eight 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 cow tails all squished together. I didn't finish. I only ate half the roll. You I, you so gave it a good try. Yeah. It was rough. I did not feel great. No, I didn't feel great about subjecting y'all to that. I felt very guilty. Yeah, I've never. That was the that was the biggest that was the the biggest fail of a food challenge. That I I've think ever that done. I you know what you could also call that a success though. Well, I guess because you did goal. because you did not eat eight cow the tails. Goal was to make memories, and we did there just we that. There we go. Um, all right, enough to, enough about Drew. Let's talk about me. Um, so I have something that I wanted to show you that I have rolled up in some socks that I have because it's delicate. <laughs> so I. Um, I actually had this last week, but I forgot to bring it in. So when I did my little uh, e-commerce conference thing, um, you know, they had like some downtime and we had activities that we got to do. Okay, yeah. And I got to do glass blowing, which I'd never done before. At a business conference? It's like a, yeah. I mean, they had like local things that people could do, like tour different parts of the city or whatever. Was there like some leadership principle involved in this? Nope. It was literally just like, hey, there's downtime. You can either rest or whatever, or there's different- Or blow glass. A variety of activities. Yeah, and there's like a glass studio. And it's like, if you want to learn about glass blowing and how it's done, you can go and whatever, melt some things down and do some stuff with it. So I made I made a paperweight. Oh my gosh. Which is uh, kind of cool. So it's not technically glass blowing because I didn't blow anything because it's not right. hollow. But you formed it. I made this. Yes, I formed wow. this with guidance, you know. But I got to stick the rod into the glass. Yeah. Into, into the, the crucible and get the, the hot molten glass. So they had all that on site? They had all that on site. Oh yeah. my God. It was cool. So yeah, I got to like, wow, you know, use a blowtorch on it and pinch it and do the, like twist it up. And I rolled the, made the blue and the white because it's good. That's things. very you. Very me, right? Very on brand. Yeah, and I like even stamped it in the back with the little logo of the place oh, that I cool. went to. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, just wanted to show that because uh, I've never made anything out of the glass. I certainly I have like, not either. I like doing handy stuff and all that. So gave me a newfound appreciation for making stuff out of glass. It's pretty, wow. uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah. So yeah, that was a new experience for me. And I have a physical token from which to remember it. Did you give this to Rachel? It's a heart. Um, it is a heart. Are you yes. giving this to me? No, it's definitely not for you. It's for, uh, no, I, I made it <laughs> like sort of for Rachel slash my daughter to see if either of them would like be super into it. And they were both like, eh, that's cool. So it might just like, it might just make it back onto the set here or something. Oh man. I mean, to be fair, it's a paperweight, which is like Still, literally anything it. could be a paperweight. Oh, I think it's super cool. I mean, I think it's cool too, but well, All right. it can move locations or whatever. I don't know. It's kind of cool. So that's awesome. Wanted to show that. That was kind of neat. Never made anything out of glass. It's uh, definitely not like it's not the easiest thing to do. Like it's not hard to do, but you gotta like have a crucible with like melted glass in it. Like it's not exactly the kind of thing that like just anybody can set up anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I could see that it's like a team building activity of some kind, going to like a local studio and getting like getting to do it is cool. But it's not exactly like woodworking where I can just like oh let me just take an hour in my afternoon and go make something in my garage. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's like a little less accessible. Yeah, but. Still a very cool process. And I can see the appeal. And it's crazy because like you're heating up the you have the hot glass and you're trying to like shape it and all that kind of stuff, but it's like cooling as you're as it's exposed to air. So it's like starts out and it's really goopy and then it like gets 
slower and and stuff like that as you're working with it so it's very much like you, there's a timing element to it all you're Ugh. very much like working with the material uh. as you do it so it's very interesting it was it was just a whole different way of working than sounds I, like I'm, it would make me anxious i mean it was guided so i like had the person that was there that was like telling time me limits freak do. me out it makes me think of like mario a little bit but it's not like like oh, when the music it's... starts getting faster and you're like, okay, okay, I'm only oh, halfway yeah. through. Yeah. It's a swimming level. It's not my fault. These take longer. But I mean, it was also cool because like, okay, like it's it's cooling down too much. So you stick it back in and heat it back up and then it's like pliable again. So I don't know. I can see, I can see how it's cool, but it's, I can also see how it gets really complex. So a lot of respect for people that work with glass. So anyway, so there was that. Um, things I did this weekend. Let's see here. Um, so I heard about this thing called Lego Boost which is a robot yes. building thing. Yes. You get to like program the robot. I've looked into that. I was yeah. going to get it uh, for Archer, but he just didn't seem super into it. And it was like $150. Yeah. I was like, mm, okay, if you're so super like, into it, I'm not doing this. Joseph loves programming, thinks robots are cool, obviously loves Lego. So I was super into the idea of Lego Mindstorms, which they don't they discontinued that set. Yeah. But that was like four hundred dollars back in the day. Wait, what? Yeah. It was it was pretty expensive. I thought they sold like little packs. I mean, I guess they had little add ons and stuff, but to get like the big set that really? had like the main computer and everything in it, because it was all programmed like through the whatever device, the thing. I don't know how. Oh it really my works. God. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah this so is all it's controlled by an app. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a like a control unit. Yeah. And then you just build on the stuff and you, you do like a robot or a cat. Yeah. You know. A guitar and stuff. So, like so you that. got that thing. So we got it. Oh, yeah. Cool. We got it. We got the robot and we had the whole experience. You know, we were just trying to get the app to communicate by Bluetooth to this thing was a whole experience. Did you use your but phone? Troubleshoot. No, we use Joseph. He has an iPad that he uses. And See, I would I would only the, want to do the, it if I knew that I could use Archer's little Kindle Fire jankety thing. Right. So yes, theoretically you can do that. You can use anything with Bluetooth, I guess, but we had to troubleshoot it a little bit and uh, I was able to do it and okay. we were able to hook it up. All right. But I had to like upload like download another Lego app, the Powered Up app, which is I guess a different app for like the Lego Creator mm. like programming series. Mm to do a firmware update so that I could then use the Boost app. So it was like a little more complex than what he was able to troubleshoot on his own. But I was also like, this is a good lesson. When you're trying to work with robotics, you're gonna have to like debug and troubleshoot and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, part of that is, you know, it's not just handed to you in a kit. You have to like go to the Lego website and go through the troubleshooting steps. So we did all that. So it was still like learning experience, but I was like trying to work outside and in like my sweaty wood chipping clothes. And Joseph's like, <laughs> trying to troubleshoot poor guy who's so patient he just wanted to build his little lego thing did you, did you get it working though like he did get it working. robots doing robot things robots doing robot things cool you can move around it's cool he's got sunglasses you can like wave to him and he'll wave and you back can do coding and, like you know mm -hmm. step by step you know yeah it's like left right forward it's pretty forward, much like drag, drag and drop type yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah you just do the whole sequencing and all that kind of cool. stuff yeah it's pretty neat it's pretty okay. neat it's a little simplified version than like what mindstorm was i think yeah but i mean for like archer's age it's i think they advertise it from seven to twelve so it's like perfect, okay. perfect age They've for that. They've been selling kind of it for thing. a couple of years, so I wasn't yeah, sure I think if it's, the yeah. compatibility was still going to be. No, I think it's fine. There's still full yeah. support. There. I mean, yeah, they still sell the okay. sets, and it was new cool. and all that kind of stuff. So nice. yeah. he's enjoyed it. So I don't know. We can talk more offline about it. If Rad. You're actually, interesting. But it was pretty neat. So that was kind of fun. Um, I was working outside this weekend in very hot, long sleeve, long. It was pant not clothing. It was not cool this weekend. It was not cool. It definitely felt like. Well, it was like what forty degrees last weekend, super cold, and then it rained. And then now it's really hot and it's apparently it's going to get cold again. So I don't know what's going on. We're all like dying in Virginia because of allergies and stuff. So that was kind oh, of God. fun and interesting. But I don't know. I got to cut a couple of trees down and chip them off and stuff like that. So it felt very productive. And I just got to enjoy the beautiful outdoors. So I always appreciate that. Didn't get any poison ivy stuff from what I can tell. So yeah, that's know, a win. That's a win. And then, Drew, I uh, watched a TV show. You did. You found time to watch a TV show I found a that was not Grey's show. Anatomy. If I can watch, if I watch it on my phone, then I can watch a show. You watch the TV show on your phone. I watch most TV shows on my phone. If it's a I show, I hope it that, was not like, cinematic in any way. I hope it was just like a sitcom or something. It was highly cinematic. Dang it, yeah. dude! Look, dude, this is just my life. Oh, right? you're killing me. So if Rachel or the kids is not like, so Rachel's playing. That's Zelda, like listening Zelda, to that's Rachel's playing Zelda Breath of the Wild. So basically that's her activity all right and you like if i gotta watch something especially if it's like a show that's not you know for kids or whatever and it's got to be something that rachel's into so there was a show called severance on apple tv plus you may have heard of it i don't have the apple kind of tv 
So um, I feel like I've heard of it. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. That's the one with the uh, with uh, Adam Scott. Yes, I yes. have. I heard this really good. I saw the trailer and I was like, "Ooh, that looks cool." I'm not usually into the psychological thrillers like necessarily. It's got to be the right kind. Yeah. But it has I was like, like a picture of him like with the top of his head cut off and like stuff's coming out of it or something like yeah, that. I remember yeah. seeing the thumbnail on yeah. ads. It's a really, really good show. That's cool. It's really cool. Well, hey, I'm It's not least... like super violent. It's not super like, I don't know. Usually those types of shows, it's like just too much. Like the true crime type shows and all that. I'm like, I don't need all these dirty details. But I like the the kind of puzzle quality and like the artistic nature of those types of shows. So it's got to be the right type of show. And Rachel, nice. Rachel, I was like, Oh, this seems really interesting. And she was like, I don't know. She's like, you know, she's got anxiety and stuff like that. So we try not to watch shows that will like feed into that. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like this. So it, it fell into that like area where I was like, I think I might want to watch this show, but she won't. So when the heck is that going to happen? I have shows like that. So too. that's when I'm just like, all right, I guess I'm watching this while I like do the dishes and whatever do, do this like cooking cooking and that's better of thing. than nothing so i can like put in an earbud nobody has to hear it i can have it on my phone and i can still get the the main gist of it as so, long as you enjoy it i don't mean to i don't mean to, to, to condemn good. your watching no, style pretty, i'm i'm happy that you got to it was, enjoy it's it that or nothing it's right no that and way. that's that's great that's great i just <laughs> yeah, I, I always think about like if i were the director or the cinematographer how i would see somebody watching my work oh. on the phone and be like no no i represent what the director's must be forced to face that yeah, most of their audience, if they're going to watch it, that's how they're going yeah, to no, watch it. Yeah, no, it's reality. Yeah. So me, I just don't watch it. I wait till I have like a week off and I just blitz a bunch of stuff. I'm, yeah. I've been I've been watching something that is completely ultra violent and insane. Oh, the, interesting. Uh, it's the Peacemaker series with John Cena on HBO. Oh, interesting. It's not, a spinoff of the this. Suicide Squad movie. Oh, okay. But yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. But one thing I will say that made me really, really happy is there was a point in the show where he was like stealing a bunch of old eighties rock vinyl albums. And he was very upset because, you know, I don't know a girl he was going to hook up with. He had to make her explode for some reason. But anyway, he goes back to his house and he's sad because the love connection was not there. And he puts on a firehouse record and mm. starts playing. Don't treat me bad by firehouse wow. and firehouse never gets any recognition. No, Brian. they don't. They don't. And they did. He should, they, they close up of the album cover and everything. I was like, <laughs> Firehouse! <laughs> I was so happy. Nice. That made me just elated. It's awesome. Yes. They know their audience on that one. That's good stuff. So yes. there you go. That was, that was my last week. All right. We do have a couple of company updates. Ooh. So let's uh, move on to that now. We have our new little pen cast room here. Um, we're working on setting up a little area over here just for to do like some unboxing type stuff, more like the overhead, you know, kind of simple stuff. Drew's on a bunch of these. Um, and so we were thought, you know, rather than, um, just having pen cast as the mainstay and then doing like these bigger videos, like just having, Hey, we got this pen in like, I don't know, the Elox would be a perfect pen to kind of fall into this category. It's like, Hey, I got this pen. It doesn't really need this whole big explanation, but we just kind of want to show what's going on with it. So we're going to be testing that out. We're working on some of the setup of that. So we may mix in some of that content here. Uh, we're working on that. Slightly better than my cell phone, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I thought your cell phone was fine, but you know, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Until you it's run fine. across something teal. In which well, case you are yeah. just done because teal it is, is a, teal's a nightmare. It really is. Yeah, it really is. Uh, trying to get teal across in digital is the worst. That's why I don't wear teal clothes. I have teal shirts that I love that I cannot wear in videos anymore because they require so much like color adjusting and stuff like that. Who cares? <sighs> I don't know. But why, why, does you, works. why does your shirt need to be I don't accurate? Know. I don't know. Doesn't necessarily, but I don't know. I think it like throws off the rest of the video or really? something like that. I don't know. Oh. I don't know how it goes, but that's what I've been told in the past. Um, so anyway, we're going to be testing that setup. So I don't know. We may mix in some content there and there could be a good opportunity for us to highlight some more like individual pens. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just another little company thing. Uh, me and a couple of our other leaders are going to a conference or will have already gone to and come back from by the time this publishes That's right. uh, a leadership conference called Small Giants. So uh, there's a book called Small Giants written by Bo Burlingham. And if you're familiar with that book at all, it feels very similar to the kind of culture that we have here at Goulet Pens. Basically companies that choose to have a strong culture, but remain small, like not necessarily drive towards growth. Because typically you think of like the Googles and the Apples and the, the big companies that have all these perks and all these things, but they're usually like, 
pretty massive companies um, striving for growth. But, um, you know, I was talking about like companies that kind of choose to stay small so that they can maintain a good culture. So yeah. Kind of flipping that. That on sounds very familiar. Bit. Yeah. And actually, this this kind of got overshadowed a little bit because uh, this is in 2020 when all the COVID stuff was like deep in it. But we are actually named one of the top 25 small giants companies. I mean, we, we like applied for it and they reviewed us with a bunch of other companies, but we were one of the top 25 for this organization. Um, and then I attended their conference virtually last year and they're having it in person this year. So uh, again, haven't traveled a whole lot, but this isn't the first one. I did one a couple of weeks ago and now I've got this one. So it's like this a two-day thing. This will be your thing, first uh, you know. plane ride though. Yeah, right? that's true. I got to drive the last one. So yeah. this will be the first flight that I've taken in a while. Since the pandemic? Um, I did fly somewhere in October last year. Oh, okay. But this will be the first like flying to a conference and doing the whole and thing. And they're not doing masks anymore on planes. <sighs> not required anyway, yeah. but I'll probably be masking just yeah. to be safe. But, you know. Just a nice added layer of freak out, though. It's just Yay! that we're, we're <laughs> it's, it just goes to show, like I booked this six months ago, something like that. Where yeah. It's like, I don't know what the world's going to look like. I'll go ahead and book it. We'll see. We, we got know. travel insurance and all yeah. this stuff just because you never know. But, you know, it's still out there. There's variants and other oh, things. Yeah. And I'm just like, all right, cross my fingers. But this is a, this is the world we're in right now. Yeah, so. Archer said the other day, like, oh, I've never gotten COVID. And I was like, yet. And yeah. he's like, huh? I'm like, it's, dude, it's. There's a good chance. Like, it's just a thing, man. Point. Like, yeah. it's just a thing now. And. Yeah, we got to live with this. Yeah. So that's where I was like, okay. I'm not trying to scare you, but. Yeah. It's. Exactly. It's not going anywhere. I try to be smart about it. But, yeah. You know, that's all you can do. Be that's diligent. all you can do. Yeah. So I'll probably be masked up the whole conference, but you know, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, I still think it's worth it, especially this is very much like a leadership company culture kind of event. So yeah. very a little different vibe. The last one I went to was like an e-commerce focused one. This mm-hmm. is not. This is for all kinds of companies, um, but it is very different. And it's like international too. There's a lot of companies that are like based in Europe and stuff like that. So just hearing like even just culturally like how things are different and, and it's just, I don't know, it's kind of cool. A lot is of your water bottle there. making a noise? Oh, I keep hitting the, the glass. It's like a whistle. Thing. Oh, it could be. It's cold. Maybe that's uh Hit the other one. if I have a cold. Oh, it's a. Oh, yeah, that's it. I could. I was like this. I had a little bit of. I have a little bit of coffee. I was. I thought I'm like, what is happening? I'm, I feel like a dog, oh. like with this, a high pitched noise, like driving me insane. And he pushed the button. It was like. Pfft. Okay. It's because the coffee's hot, and if it sits there for a while, a little bit of pressure builds up. Yeah. Oh my god, that was freaking me out. Okay. There okay. You go. You're good. I'm good. You know, that's all I could hear. That's all you could hear because I couldn't hear it at all. Yeah. Well, there you ADD. Go. There you go. What are you gonna do? All right, that's it we get for company updates, and I think we are wrapping it up, Drew. We're literally going to go do the pen uh, unboxing video setup right now. We're going to do our That's our, our plan. We got it on the calendar. All right, so let's wrap this thing up. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please leave us some feedback about what you think of this video in the comments. Ask us some questions. Give us some ideas for tips and tricks or pens that you want to see us talk about. Um, this is why we do this, is to interact with you all. You can definitely check out GoodlyPens.com for your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. Like and subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, all the places where we are. Uh, you can email us at pencast at GoodlyPens.com if you have any questions that you want us to answer on the show. And my random fun fact is truly a random fact today. Apparently, this is unverified off the internet as well, so I have no follow-up details beyond this. But uh, apparently firefighters use wetting agents to make their water wetter. Wait, wetting? Wetting agents. Uh, The chemicals reduce the surface tension of plain water, so it's easier to spread and soak into objects, which is why it's known as wet water. So I don't know anything beyond that. It piques my curiosity. I'm like, I want to research this. Yeah. I was thinking about like, Fountain pen ink and flow and They're using ITF surface technology tension and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> what is it that's in this water? So I'm curious now. I don't have any more information than this. If you have information, let us know in the comments. Or if you're a firefighter and you know what's going on, I don't know why some water would be wetter than others, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. That is really fascinating. I had, yeah. I've never heard anything like that before. Me neither. That's why I put it in here. Wow. I hope it's actually a thing because I just pulled it off like random trivia facts on the internet. And I hope that it's If it's not true, a thing, let it be a lesson to you about trusting things on the internet. Yeah. Including, PSA from the Goulet Pen Company. Including us? I don't know. No, no. It's a lesson then that we're, oh, we're, we're, we're make, bestowing we're the knowledge. We're making an example of ourselves. Yes, yeah. Yes. So it's okay. going to be one or the other. It's going to be either knowledge or a cautionary tale. Okay. Either way, you're welcome. The lesson is that you should always verify your own facts. 
for whatever you hear on the internet. That is the actual lesson. Mm. Boom. Mic drop. That's all we got for you this week. Hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you on the next one. Right on, everybody.